you're aware of any apologies, I'm aware of apologies from William Humphrey. Clark, is that all? Yep, yeah. well, that's great. Okay, agenda item two then, members, is chairperson's business. Can I advise members that it is understood that due to COVID-19 restrictions, primary schools and others which provide support to children preparing for the post-primary transfer exams have been unable to do so in the normal manner. Consequently, those organisations involved in the provision of the non-statutory post-primary transfer tests uh, are to ask the Minister to facilitate delays to the usual timings for post-primary transfer. Um, can I seek members' agreement for the Education Committee to receive oral evidence from AQE, that's the Association of Quality Education, and the Post-Primary Transfer Consortium, PPTC, as soon as possible? Agreed. Members agreed? Okay, Clark. Agreed. Clark, do you need us to clarify whether that's in a formal or informal session? Well, that's, I was hoping we could talk about that at the a work programme program program. session, if that's okay. Okay, that's great. Okay, next agenda item then, members, is teachers' pay and conditions. Can I advise members that the Northern Ireland Teachers Council has written to the Department of Education indicating that the pay and conditions dispute uh, is now resolved and that industrial action can now cease? Uh, members content to note that extremely uh, positive step okay. forward. Yeah. Yep. 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 That's obviously an issue that we prioritised to see a, a, a resolution on and hopefully that is um, a, an extremely positive step forward. Uh, we know the, the impact that um, that ongoing dispute was having on teachers and school leaders uh, and the ability of, of schools to plan so hopefully that is a a very helpful development for everyone involved in education in Northern Ireland. Um, next agenda item then, members, is childcare. Can I advise members that the Department of Education advise that application forms for the £12 million childcare support package will issue to childcare providers this week? Um, perhaps we can get a bit more detail on that from the Minister and Permanent Secretary uh, when they're with us shortly. Members content to note? Yep. 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 Okay yep. then. Agenda item three is draft minutes. Can I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 22nd of April 2020 at page six and seek members agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Agenda item four is matters arising. Can I inform members there are no matters arising and check no one has any matters to raise? No? No. Okay. Agenda item five then, members, is the Department of Education oral briefing on the budget 2020-2021. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the clerk at page 13, a budget template completed by the Department of Education at page 27, a previous Department of Education paper on budget pressures at page 61, details of the teacher's pay agreement at page 70, Information on school deficits at page 72. Correspondence on the voluntary exit schemes at page 97. Fresh start capital projects information at page 102. And a raised paper assembly committee's coordinated budget scrutiny at page 104. Can I also refer members to tabled items, a summary budget correspondence from Department of Education, a Department of Education response on its bid for funding for prep schools and boarding schools, and the April 2020 Capital Project Progress Report. Okay, members, can I confirm then that we have Mr. Gary Fair, Director of Finance from the Department of Education, Ms. Susan Anderson, <coughs> Deputy Finance Director, Department of Education, and I think Philip Irwin, Director of Investment and Infrastructure at the Department of Education. Is that right? That's correct. That's great. Okay. Can I advise officials and members that the evidence session will be reported by Hansard and give a, a warm welcome to our officials. Uh, obviously, every year the budget process appears to be in a different format in recent years, and this year is certainly no exception. I understand that owing to COVID-19 issues, there are significant pressures on certain departmental budgets and that consequently a further vote on account may be required. 
I would therefore invite you to make a brief presentation to the committee based on the written information that you've provided and reflecting on the emerging budget picture. And perhaps also in that presentation, you can advise if education is one of the reportedly five departments that is due uh, to uh, go out of money owing to the COVID-19 pressures. Okay, can I invite you then to make your short presentation and we'll take questions from the members thereafter. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Can everybody hear me okay? That's good. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for invite us, inviting us along. Uh, I was going to, my suggested approach would be, um, I invited Philip Irwin to join us because, as you can see from the completed template that we uh, forwarded to you, there's quite a lot on capital as well, so it would be uh, uh, more meaningful use of your time to also have Philip with me. <clears throat> so I was going to suggest maybe just the last time that I briefed the committee, um, we didn't have a budget allocation at that stage, so I was going to suggest just updating you on where we've got to from that point of view, and also on the budget process that you alluded to there, Chair, and then I'll make some reference, uh, if you're content, to the template in terms of the pressures this year, because some of them have now been amended, uh, partially in light of the, the whole COVID situation, but also just in the process of time, we've had a chance to look at some of those bids because, as always, we try to be as robust as possible when we're bidding for resources from the centre. Are you content with that approach? And then I'll pass over to Philip to, to make some comment on the capital side. Yes, thank you. Is that okay? So since, since I updated you before, the department was allocated its 2021 uh, resource budget uh, of 2 billion. 276 million, which includes 42 million ring fence for special education needs and 16.5 million confidence and supply funding. As you know, that was confidence and supply funding was a risk the last time that I briefed you. So it was helpful that we got that included. So this, this uh, effectively taking everything into account, this reflected an increase of 226.6 million. It's about an 11% increase on last year's resource budget. Um, so, And we also had included, it wasn't specified, but uh, there was, uh, sorry, it did include the pension contributions. If you recall, last year we had to overcommit at the start of the year because there was a pensions pressure that we weren't funded for, but we did have an agreement with the Department of Finance that we could bid for it in year. So thankfully this year we've got that included as part of our baseline. Ah. So I had reported the last time that we had pressures of 393 million, excluding the uh, the NDNA commitments, including the NDNA commitments. The pressures were 427 million. So obviously, with the with the allocation that we've got, that reduces the pressure now to about 165 million. So there's still some challenging decisions. Added to the fact, of course, that we're in extraordinary circumstances and uh, the department and the arm's length bodies, particularly education authority, are facing some pressures as a result of that. We have made bids and I'll come to those shortly. So, um, obviously we didn't know where we were going to end up in terms of our initial allocation. So, it's, uh, it's obviously not meeting all of the pressures that we identified. But in some ways, it's not as bad as we, we were concerned it might have been at a certain point in time. But there's still very significant challenges for the minister as he continues to think to, to decide how he might want to allocate money. That, that process has been delayed to some extent, to be fair, on the minister from the point of view that we have been, as I said, seeking additional funding for COVID-related pressures. And that process continues. In terms of... Process, Chair, you made reference to the fact that uh, some departments could run out of cash very soon uh, because of some of the additional pressures that are coming through with the COVID crisis. Uh, as a result, it, uh, obviously with the, the, the SSE and the, the first budget bill debate on 24th of February, that gives departments about 45% cash, both in account as it's called, for the new financial year. But the way things have been going, that's probably not going to be enough. Plus the main estimates and the second budget bill, the normal second budget bill, uh, isn't likely to be happening in June as it normally does. So 
yes, as you alluded to, departments like ourselves would be under pressure in cash terms, quite likely, if we didn't get additional cash approved. So the plan now is to that the, the budget budget bill number two is likely to be primarily focused on voting additional cash for departments just to see them through, possibly until the autumn when the normal budget bill will be passed that will agree the budget on the main estimates for 2021. But that delay is primarily because of the COVID crisis. That's just general, some general background there. Can I refer members then to the template that we forwarded to you? Um, now we covered within that, this is a standard template as you, you're probably aware for, that all departments have been asked to submit to their scrutiny committees. So I'm actually just going to look, I can go back over any aspects you want, but I'm just going to look at page 9 of the template. Sorry, just, just a second, just to remind members that the template is at page 27 of our packs. Is that right, Clark? Yeah. Yep. Page 27 of our packs. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Go we'll ahead. give you a minute. Are you okay finding that? Go ahead, there. Okay, so I'm not going to... If you look at page 9 of, of that, it's part B, departmental budgetary requirements and revenue estimates. This... Uh, this is the part that you will probably recognize some of. Um, the first column of figures, pre-COVID-19, you look on page 11 and total, if you add the 413.9 under total pressures, and then there's a further table with a total of 13. If you add those two amounts together, that comes to the 427 million that I had referred to when I briefed you previously. And that included all the pressures, including new NDNA commitments. So I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but I just want to pick up where there have been changes since the last briefing, and to refer to page 10. Um, now, I'll, I'll point out at the top, actually, of page 10, uh, we obviously identified significant send pressures, as you know from briefings probably we've always given the committee. Uh, we've always highlighted that there's always significant demand-led send pressures. So we were very pleased to have received a ring fenced allocation for that, which will give the Minister some freedom in deciding how that is allocated this year when its decisions are made. Um, significant pressures there. Um, and then the, the next one I would refer to is the implementation of the new SEN framework as required under the new as required under the new SEN Act. As you'll note, the pressure has reduced from thirty million to seventeen and a half million. And again that's it's, it's partly taking account of what's going on. All of the pressures have been reviewed in light of the COVID crisis. I would say that at the outset because I think everybody would, would acknowledge we're an extraordinary and an extraordinary set of circumstances, and that has required really all of departmental business, not just our own, but across departments, have had to review really what is achievable because there has there, there has been an immediate response over the last few weeks, and a, and a big part of that has been ensuring that. Uh, departmental staff and education authority and other arms length body staff have been taking very quick and immediate action to try and get as many people working remotely as possible, which has actually been on the whole very successful. Uh, certainly for the department we have I think the majority of people now working remotely in some form or other, uh, which has enabled us to address both the very urgent requirements over the last few weeks but also where our focus is also on trying to maintain as much business as usual as possible. But obviously with schools closed, that also has an impact on what can be taken forward. So obviously the SEND framework is a very important area of work that needs to be taken forward. And the 17.5 million at this stage assumes that schools might be open in September. Again, there's, there's not clear clarity on that yet, and a lot of it, it, it primarily depends on... Uh, health advice on, on what action should be taken over the coming months. But that's the assumption at the moment. So again, that may have to be reviewed later in the year. That would allow some of the, the early work to begin on that. There's an additional sure start pressure there that has, has been identified by the Health and Social Care Board. Recently highlighted pressure of 1.45 million. That really is just to, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite clear why it came through late in the day, but it is primarily to ensure that existing services continue as normal. So that, that's probably, probably been to be a fairly high priority bid, not, not 
not a large amount in, in terms of the whole, but an important bid. Uh, the voluntary exit scheme, there was an estimated requirement of $22 million, and we had a bit of discussion about, around that at the last, uh, the last time I was at the Brunswick Committee. That has been reviewed. Again, this is a difficult one to estimate accurately in advance of the year. The best estimate at this stage is, is down to about $10 million because you'll note as well from the, the update and the template on last year's outturn that we, uh, all of the, the boundary access scheme funding, which is ring-fenced and we can't use for any other purpose, wasn't required, and we therefore gave it up at various points in the year. And obviously the sooner, as with everything, the sooner we give up something like that, because it can't be used for other purposes, the better from the, the point of view of the centre, because it can be reallocated for other purposes. Um, and then moving down, a new nurture programme. Obviously, the Minister is, is still sees this as a priority, but realistically, the cost, what, what is likely to be spent this year, has reduced, again, primarily because a lot of, of uh, settings are closed at the moment, uh, but it's still obviously a priority, but the costs have been reviewed. And again, similarly, in other resource pressures, the nutritional standards aspect has been taken, has been removed altogether now, so that's reduced the pressure from 1.4 to 1.4 million. And shared education, we had identified a 3.8 pressure that was linked to uh, external sources of funding for shared education. Again, with all that's going on, uh, there is already some baseline funding for shared education and that's deemed to be sufficient in terms of what is real realistically what the department is realistically able to spend this year. Delivery of a child care strategy for Northern Ireland uh, has been reduced. Again, this this is always some of some of these areas you'll you'll realise, given that there are still significant budget pressures, the budget in some ways does drive what is achievable. And that's obviously a challenge for the minister as he thinks through what can be delivered. The nine million really reflects certain things that could potentially be taken forward as the year proceeds, but the, fifth, uh, the, uh, the original fifteen million is, uh, has, you know, has been revised in light of what's going on. Now, the next set of bids, which I know uh, you'll be speaking to the minister and Derek about in more detail, possibly, just to cover, we have bid for a total of ninety-three million. Uh, on under the COVID-related uh, heading, and these, these are issues really that we identified at very very quick turnaround time. We had to you, know, you have to acknowledge it was uh, every department was, was faced with a, a very difficult decisions, and we had to come through with as robust bids as we could with a very short turnaround time. So in terms of meals provision, the focus of this is ensuring that children that would have been entitled to preschool meals receive, uh, continue to receive uh, those and some forth. So that the decision taken in order to get this moving quickly was to get money into parents' banks account, bank account covering meals of about £2.70 per meal. <coughs> so that we did succeed in getting 19 point, an allocation of £19.3 million for that. Uh, obviously, there is there are other factors in society that it could impact on this pressure as the year proceeds, such as obviously the whole of, it, the, whole of the economy and the whole of society is affected by what's going on, so there could be more, there are likely to be a lot more claims for universal credit, which again could increase the entitlement throughout the year. So that will have to be kept under review, and we may have to submit further bids as the year proceeds. And then childcare, which was referred to again primarily to ensure that key workers can continue to work and have, their, their, have, a, have the least disruption, really, in terms of the, the care of their children. So we succeeded in getting a 12 million allocation for that. And uh, there's also a bid that's been put forward for a hardship fund for substitute teachers. Uh, this is an ongoing discussion as to how best to deal with this. The Minister's giving some thought to it. The bid is in the range of 12 to 14 million. So we've, we had originally bid for 12 million. It might not be quite as high as that. It just depends. To some extent, it depends on whether we are successful in getting money from the centre under the COVID heading. Uh, but that's something that's currently under consideration by the Minister. There are other education authority pressures, 10.4 million. That covers things like uh, 
additional cost of soap, antibacterial and other cleaning materials, increased cleaning costs to cover extended cleaning, um, loss of income that would have come, come through for school meals, loss of income relating to the, the music service, reduction in private hire taxi costs, uh, uh, sorry, that's offset against the pressures, there's various pressures that the education authority is facing. And this is, I should emphasise in terms of the COVID beds, it is all a bit fluid. Some pressures are really only becoming clearer with the passage of time and as, and as uh, organisations are seeking to, to normalise with the current arrangements. So uh, we're going to have to keep these under review and we may have to bid for additional resources. Uh, again, no, no clarity as to, as to what bids might be met because there are very significant pressures across the Northern Ireland bloc that are being bid for under COVID. Um, SIA then originally bid a draft of bid of about 5.2 million. Now that has since been revised given the decisions that the Minister took on examinations. There were various assumptions around the 5.2 million, so that's been revised down to about 1.6 million. And again, we're considering how that might be met if, if it wasn't met from the centre. Uh, VG, GMI, a voluntary grammar and grant maintained integrated canteen. The, the 4.0 million pressure there really relates to the loss of income again because they would have relied on external income to, to fund those. Preparatory school costs, that's again related to fee income. Uh, the general, I should say the, that the general assumption is that um, with the current arrangements, if, if schools or other organisations are funded from the public purse, the assumption is that the staff should not be furloughed, therefore, because the staff are going to continue to be paid. The problem with preparatory schools is that there's maybe only 30% of the cost, staff costs, for instance, are paid out of the public purse, but from a consistency, it's just keeping the consistency of the message there. So we have made a bid for 2.3 million to try and cover the shortfall that some of those preparatory schools are facing. Similar situation as regards boarding schools. We've had a number of queries around this and they're, uh, again, linked to the loss of income. So we have uh, made a bid for 1.8 million. Pathways referred to here. Um, this is obviously an organisation to support children to age four. And, and the, the, the key purpose of that bid, these, these were some, some settings that perhaps weren't successful this year in receiving government funding. But because of the shutdown, they don't have the opportunity then to, you know, seek income from elsewhere. So in order to protect those settings, we've made a bid for 0.725 million. And then the, the other, in the next table, uh, it's referring to the NDNA commitments. Again, whilst these things are still in the mix, there are significant pressures. So it's all part of the mix that the minister is currently considering. Uh, and that's maybe all I want to say at this stage. Perhaps if, if, if you want to ask me any questions on the resource side before I, I hand over to Philip, would that suit best? Yep, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll start us off. Uh, Gary, so the mm -hmm. Department of Education previously bid for £427 million in resource pressures, correct? Yes. And you received an allocation of £227 million from the Department of Finance? Yes. Okay, so that leaves a, a, a pressure of approximately £200 million remaining? Yeah. Okay, and what are the implications of that £200 million pressure on the ground for education? Well, it does still leave significant pressures, but we're not the only department facing that. And as I said, when I was in front of the committee before, I think we all have to be realistic in the current financial environment. and. It's, it's the conundrum, I suppose, that the departments are in, particularly ourselves, where uh, there will have to be trade-offs, and the Minister will obviously seek to do what he can, as always, to protect frontline service delivery as far as possible. And then, you know, it just does require, it does require a lot of thought, I suppose, as to where the impact might be. It's mitigating impacts as far as possible, and I know that the Minister is is giving considerable thought to that, which is by why there's been a delay in getting budgets out, bills and other organisations at the moment. Okay, there are obviously specific 
uh, ongoing pressures there in, ter in terms of key priorities for the committee, such as special educational needs and childcare provision, also school budgets. Um, the new decade, new approach document set out a, a commitment for the school budget deficits to be urgently addressed. Um, mm -hmm. Has that been achieved by this budget allocation or does, does a deficit remain? Well, the, the final decisions are, are uh, up to the Minister, obviously. We, have, we, we provide advice, the Minister considers the advice. Uh, the reality is the NDNA commitments and, and certain other pressures were always dependent on what the final budget would look like. And there, there's always been a degree of realism around that. And it may be that some of the NDNA commitments, while still ex being executive commitments, they, they may take uh, a longer period of time to take forward. But I think the, fo the Minister's focus will, will, I imagine, be on continuing to really try and protect frontline services. So what, what is the current shortfall for the budget? Well, we'll not know until the Minister makes his final decisions on what the school budgets will look like. That's, that's part of the mix, because obviously that will be impacted by other decisions. And when will he be doing that? Um, well, I, th I think fairly soon. Uh, from the Minister's point of view, he is obviously seeking to secure, maximise whatever funding can get relating to COVID-related pressures, which I think is entirely appropriate, because they're unanticipated pressures and they're just adding to the difficulties. So uh, from a timing point of view, that's, that's a sensible approach. So we would hope fairly soon. You know, uh, I don't want to give a time. I don't, I don't want to restrict the Minister's freedom there, but I know that he is giving it priority and he's certainly giving it considerable thought. Okay. And um, do you believe that the, in the further executive budget allocation process, for example, in May, that the Department of Education is, is going to receive further resource allocation to address that deficit? Uh, sorry, are you referring to the next budget bill? Yeah. The, the focus of the next budget bill, as I understand it, will be primarily on ensuring that departments have enough cash to spend over the coming months with all the uncertainty that's around, and that will take, take account of um, additional money that departments are receiving under the COVID heading. Uh, so it's, my understanding is that it will not, it'll not be the normal budget number two bill that would confirm budgets for this and main estimates. So it's, it's, not, it's not providing you with additional funds, it's releasing existing allocated funds? It's primarily focused on cash and ensuring that we are able to proceed and, and spend the, the, you know, the cash to back up the existing budgets that have been agreed. So at this stage you're entering 20, uh, 2021 with an approximately £200 million shortfall in the Department of Education budget? Yes, in line with the... In line, well, it's 100, 160... Roughly 164, 165 million is what, is what has been identified, plus uh, any unmet COVID related bids that are in that template. So, yeah, it's in ballpark terms, we, uh, there are still significant pressures. Okay, I'll, I'll bring members in on, on specific matters then and start with the Deputy Chairperson, Karen Mullen. Good morning, Gary. Good morning. Thank you very much for your, uh, your update and all the papers that you have provided. Um, I just have a few questions, and I think you've answered a good wee bit there, but um, you outlined some budgetary headings there that will reduce the cause of the situation that we're in. Yeah. This thing, is it possible for you to provide us with an assessment as to whether or not there have been any savings in terms of resource due to the reduction in school operations over the last number of weeks? It's quite difficult to assess. I suppose the, the, my personal view on that would be that because schools have been under such significant budgetary pressures over the last number of years, yeah. um, and because um, many schools, the bulk of many schools, well, the bulk of all schools' expenditure is staff cost, and that could be as high as 95% yeah. in some cases. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's difficult, it would be difficult to assess that, but even if we did assess that there were certain savings, you know, we know that schools are already under pressure and probably will still be yeah. under pressure, even if we can give them more in their budgets this year. Yeah, what sort of brought me on to my next point, and um, you've highlighted there the increase 
um, in the budget this year, unfortunately, before COVID happened. I know we still would have had pressures, yeah. but we've added pressures now. Um, and this is the first significant increase that we have had in the education budget for quite a number of years. Yeah. I suppose that was bringing me on the, uh, you know, could you advise at this stage the likely impact on school budgets for the financial year going forward. I know the aspiration has been um, sustainable core budgets, um, uh, but with all of this um, and just what you've outlined there, um, you know, the increase that you've already outlined, uh, will it go um, as far as we need in terms of addressing that, even though we still have that um, shortfall that you've mentioned? I don't believe it'll go as far as we have identified they need to go to, but uh, we're hopeful, subject to the Minister's decisions, that at least there will be an increase to the aggregate of schools budget, the money that's going out to schools through the formula this year. And certainly uh, we secured the funding uh, uh, for, we secured sufficient funding to fund the teachers' pay increase, for instance. So, yeah. But it's not going to be as much as we, we reckon we would need to really offset that, that you know, the build-up of deficits over the years and the shortfall that has been that we've identified in some detail to the committee in the past. And so it's not going as far as we would like. No. But, but we'll have to, well, the Minister has to do the best with what he's got. And I know he, he certainly made a, an, an excellent pitch in, in securing what we did get in terms of the $127 million. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose it's a step. It's, it's, a, it's over a process probably of a number of years. We have to address many, many years of austerity here yeah, and then as yeah. with the COVID press, pressures on top. Just as she touched on it there, and this is my last question, Chair, just in relation to the common funding formula, obviously we, we had known that there was a review going on and we had charity the last time. I know yeah. that COVID has hit, but is there a paper, uh, just the status on that, and has there been a paper been able to be presented to the Minister on what that's going to look like? Well, we were all set. <laughs> we we had <laughs> we, we had our and had, had everything ready. First of all, to go to the department's um, uh, top management group policy review group, uh, and then it would have gone on to the minister. But just at that time, both the COVID crisis had to shut down. So I think, as a foreign part of the transformation program, everything was put on hold temporarily. Um, probably. I would talk to the minister, but it's maybe maybe not the right timing yet for us to share any more on that with you because the minister yeah. hasn't, hasn't had a chance to consider. And just with all that's going on, it, it wouldn't be seen as a top priority at the moment. Yeah. No, no problem, Gary. That's great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. No problem. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Robin Newton. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair, and thank you to, to Gary. I wonder, could I just explore... Uh, two areas with you, Gary, and mm -hmm. the really areas where we should be investing uh, for the future of our the education of our children, and very much in their preparatory stages for education, mm -hmm. and that's around the area of both the child care strategy and the nurture strategy. Yeah, nurture investment. <clears throat> in terms of the child care strategy, I think you had originally when you spoke to us indicated that. Uh, you were seeking a budget of around 15 million. Yes. Uh, and, and we're now talking about 9 million. Uh, maybe you could uh, expand uh, uh, upon that. Uh, and indeed, just around the, the nurture area, where uh, certainly I know it, it's uh, a matter that is, uh, if not all the members, uh, certainly the majority of members, would see uh, investment in that as, uh, as being important. Uh, and, and whether or not we can actually achieve the uh, with the 1.4 million, the additional uh, 29 nurture units in primary schools. Um, so, could you maybe talk around that and the, the rationale of, of, of yeah. the nine instead of 15 million for childcare? Okay. Yeah. In terms of child, the childcare strategy, first of all, um, obviously executive approval is required to finalise any strategy. Um, and there were various options. Uh, I wasn't able to go into the detail when I was in front of the committee before because it didn't have all the detail. But I think maybe you got a, you might have got a more detailed update the following week. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. The initial estimate, uh, yes, that, that's what was identified as the potential. As I'd said the last time, in general, in general terms, it's a difficult, difficult one. There, there are various options. 
and obviously different costs with different options. So it was always um, our best estimate of it at the, at the stage when we were submitting bids. Um, and so the, the costs are always going to be dependent on the scope of the strategy and the pace and the scale of the rollout of an extended offer. So this revised estimate really, um, it's dependent on progressing to publication of the strategy in July or August this year. Uh, so, and, and obviously, again, that's subject to all, all everything else that's going on and whether that's achievable. But that's that would be the plan at the moment, and it, and it would be a more realistic. In some ways, it's, it's for example, ensuring that the likes of the Bright Start funding can continue this yeah. year. And it, it'll pay for some admin and salaries, getting the, the departmental team up and running, ready to take a lot of that work forward. Okay. So, okay. I think okay. it's, and it's, how, how much of that, uh, I mean, uh, how, how firm would you be at this stage on that? Or is how much speculation is there in that bid? Well, I think that's probably a realistic enough bid at this stage, yeah. Now, again, this and everything else is subject to the Minister's final budget decisions, obviously, but in terms of a bid, we did, uh, as I said, some of, some of this has been quite fast moving. Even in, even before COVID hit, some of the bidding process was quite fast moving. So we were moving uh, as nimbly as we could to pull together realistic bids because we do like to be robust before we go anywhere near the Department of Finance. Okay. Uh, we don't want to undermine that good relationship that we have. So then we have had an opportunity to review these again, partly in light of COVID and, and just partly with the passage of time, what's realistic and deliverable. So, yeah, I think... The nine minute million we reckon is a realistic enough. Very solid build. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the nurture area? Uh, yes, the original pressure was two point four million. Um, and I know it's the minister's desire to expand nurture. But obviously with the closure of schools in response to COVID nineteen, it hasn't been possible to launch you know, a new nurture programme. It's it's not going to be possible to launch a new programme at the start of the school financial year. So really, this, the 1.5 bid, I think largely probably just continues to ensure that the, the current arrangements are in place primarily, and hopefully with some movement towards uh, developing, developing this further, looking more to the future. Again, it's, it's just realism in the midst of all that's going on. Yeah. Uh, are we going to talk uh, in, in a few minutes about the NDA pressures and the particularly the underachievement uh, strategy, addressing underachievement. And you can see the connection between childcare, nurture, and underachievement. Yeah. Um. I think if you want to go ahead and ask a question on that, Robin, go ahead. Yeah, so if, if, if you can, I mean, I mean, we're going to, uh, you know, within your budget paper, Gary, we're, we're going to look at, uh, I'm, I'm trying to find it now, just... Uh, You've mentioned the yeah uh, the NDNA pressures um, uh, addressing the links between educational underachievement and socioeconomic background. Yeah. Uh, you've a bid in there for ten million. Yeah, right. Uh, now that's that's now ring fenced, uh, but we're we're looking at the uh, those other two areas of childcare and nurture, which obviously feed into the uh, educational underachievement as well. Yeah. And I suppose if we if we don't get the the childcare and the nurture unit uh, together, then we're we're not providing the right and the strongest possible foundation for addressing educational underachievement in the longer term. Mm -hmm. And I acknowledge your point. I think uh, certainly my understanding would be that this is obviously seen as a significant priority by the minister, but it's all wrapped up in the limited resources that we have and what, what can actually be delivered realistically within the budget constraints that we have. But I do completely acknowledge your point. There's an interrelationship there that's very important. Yes. Uh, okay, well, look, thank you for that. Thank you. Robin, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robin. If I can just supplement a question with regards to addressing links between education underachievement and socioeconomic background project, um, the, the 10 million, is that an identified pressure still at this stage or is that an allocation? No, it's an identified pressure. 
Okay. I mean, really, at, really at the moment, the only things, as I as I indicated at the very start, the only things that were specified when we got our budget allocation was the 42 million that was ring fenced, ring fenced for special education needs, and the 16 and a half confidence and supply, previous confidence and supply funding. Okay. So really, uh, largely, and we didn't get any allocation for voluntary action scheme, which is normally a ring fence fund as well. So we haven't done anything there. So again. That, the 10 million that have identified there as a pressure, that's in the mix as well. So the, the minister has a fair degree of freedom in how he allocates the resources. Yeah, apart I, yeah I, was, I was going to say, I realise this is uh, a matter for the minister yeah. to a significant extent, but your understanding is that the addressing links between educational underachievement and socioeconomic background project is not scheduled to commence? I think it's just, at the moment it's just part in the mix of uh, realistically what can be taken forward. So I'm, I'm not saying yes or no on that. It's, it's well, we can maybe come back to that with the Minister. I mean, uh -huh. we, we appreciate that there is pressure on the education transformation programme in general, but given the extent to which members and the public are raising concerns around um, variable access to distance learning and resources needed for that, um, one would think that examining and addressing links between socioeconomic background and educational opportunity and achievement remains extremely urgent and important. Therefore, I think we would like further information as to why that project would not be going ahead in, in some shape or form. We appreciate that the focus is, of course, on the COVID-19 response, but we can't expect that all government departments are going to cease all other operations other than COVID-19, especially when many of those operations relate to responding adequately to COVID-19. And I, and I would agree with that, and I, and I did at the outset make it clear, we're, as a department, we're seeking to ensure that we're addressing the most immediate issues, as well as now that most people are working remotely, taking as much business as usual forward as possible. So as I would emphasize again, I haven't said yes or no on that 10 million. I think it's just the point I'm making is it's within the mix as the minister is uh, thinking through what his budget decisions will be. But ultimately, financial constraints, no matter what way you look at it for all departments, impact to some extent what can be done. And in a year, it's, it's not to say that certain things aren't a priority. Okay. Daniel McCrossan. Yes, th thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Guy, for uh, your presentation and for uh, being with us this morning again. Um, no problem. There's, enough, there's quite a, a lot of detail there and a number of questions. Just if, if you bear with me and Chair, I'll be as, as swift as possible. And just one that jumps out, even prior to the outbreak of COVID-19, uh, there was uh, an expected shortfall or pressure, for want of a better word, of an excess of $400 million. Uh, you, you've just explained there this morning that that is now expected uh, to be around $165 million, uh, which I heard from the BBC News before this committee, just incidentally, which I must mention as well. Um, but the, the um, I'm just wondering, of the money allocated from the British government and from the executive for specifically COVID-19, has any of those specific funds been used to plug that gap? No, anything that we have been successful getting onto the COVID heading, uh, from an accountability point of view, we have to be very careful that that is used for the purpose that it was bid for. And we, we have separate accountability, governance and accountability arrangements around that to ensure that uh, you know, further down the line, it can be fully accounted for. I think that's important. So it's not, it's it's not used to, to fill a previous, uh, to plug a, a previous gap that we identified. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm uh, delayed to hear that. Guy. Just just to clarify then, for for the sake of this, uh, the difference then from the 427 uh, million, which was the original figure, to the 165. Yeah. Was that difference plugged by the money allocated under the agreement between uh, the uh, parties during the talks process and the British government? No, well, that's still a gap. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, before we got our budget allocation, I suppose we were just we were ensuring that we were bidding for absolutely everything that we where we felt there was a pressure, including NDNA commitments. Um, so, no, that's still a gap. That's an unfunded yeah. gap. 
so, so I'm just I'm just wondering, you know, what's been done between the, the original figure of 427 million to 165? What, what funds have been used to bring that down to that level? Uh, well, it's reduced by this combination of the allocation that we got. We got an extra 226, 27 yeah, million. And then, as well as that, we have reviewed some of the pressures in light of the current circumstances and, and also, I suppose, in light of what is truly deliverable this year, even, even leaving aside the current circumstances. So that, that's brought the gap down to about 165. Okay, and and just just on that, uh, when when we're discussing it, um, it just concerns me that there is such uh, a, an overcommitment in the expenditure by the department, and I appreciate entirely why pressures exist. Obviously, the absence of the institution for three years now, struck with COVID nineteen and, and other challenges as well that would generally have come. Uh, what what does the department tend to do to balance uh, its budget by the end of this year, and what will happen if if we can't effectively? Uh, well, sorry, I would just emphasise we're not we're not overcommitting as such. The budget decisions haven't been finalised yet. The minister is still considering how he can live within the budget that he's been allocated. Uh, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the fact that the department may wish to bid for additional resources through the in-year monitoring rounds, but uh, no, the plan would be certainly to to plan to live within budgets. Now, yeah. obviously, pressures as has happened in the in the last number of years. Some pressures relating to school spend, etc., may still come through in the form of increasing deficits, which the education authority ultimately has to pick up the tab for. So that that again could put the education authority's budget under pressure by the end of this year. But uh, there's no sense that. No, sorry, I did refer. Maybe I'm confusing the situation by referring to the fact that last year we did start the year by overcommitting by a certain amount. But that was on the basis that we had an informal agreement with the Department of Finance that we could bid for the shortfall and the pension pressure at in year monitoring. But it's, it's, never, it's never the intention to set out the year uh, with the intention of overspending. And that, that's, I suppose, why the Minister is wisely taking his time to think through how best to allocate the budget that he, that he has so that, that he's not taking irresponsible, I suppose, in that way. But, but I'd be right in saying that it will be extremely difficult for business to continue as usual, regardless of COVID, the COVID-19 situation, in a way, uh, to uh, operate as normal within budget. Uh, and, and, and obviously that's what's leading to the pressure, so I can, I can understand that and I appreciate that. Gary, just, just following on from the Education Authority point that you've uh, rightly made, um, uh, they seem to run out of money quite often. Um, uh, I noticed that they maintain a flexible IOU system with schools until their deficit grows uh, to the point where intervention is required. I'm just wondering what criteria uh, do you apply to determine when intervention is necessary, or, or, or do you have any understanding of that? Uh, the approach that the education sor- education authority takes now it'll be, it'll be slightly delayed probably this year because schools are closed at the moment, but they. they have uh, what they call local management of schools officers who engage directly with individual schools to discuss their financial planning for the year ahead and on a, a three-year on a three-year basis, which is difficult, obviously, in the current financial climate. So there there is robust engagement that goes on uh, at the start of the year. Now, as you probably are aware from the letters that I've written to schools uh, in the past, I'm always stressing the importance of good and early financial planning. Even if it identifies that uh, that for some schools it's just not deliverable, that they cannot live within the budgets, I think the important thing is that uh, that they are that, that the education authority through the LMS officers is uh, securing that assurance from schools that they boards of governors accepted that they are doing all that they can do to live within their budgets and agree a plan, a realistic plan that may not be a balanced plan necessarily for individuals and will obviously lead to a deficit position, but uh, at least at the start of the year they will agree what actions a school may need to take further down the line to live within budget. So there is, there are very firm uh, financial management arrangements in place between the department and the education authority and the education authority and schools, individual schools, uh, with a degree of realism given the current financial constraints, but nonetheless robust arrangements. Uh, and certainly that's something in each time that the Education Authority will be investing more in is the robust monitoring 
of those uh, the sales plans throughout the year. But certainly a robust position at the start of the year as plans are being agreed. And there have been improvements in the last, certainly last year there was a significant improvement in getting those plans approved sooner rather than later so that there was, there was a clarity on what they had to spend and the difficult decisions that they had to make if, ne if need be. Uh, I'm just wondering, so, so just to clarify, so are you aware if there is a set criteria, for instance, um, to determine when intervention is necessary by the Education Authority or is it done on a case-by-case -case basis? Because if it's a case-by-case -case basis, then that gives me some concern about consistency and approach and monitoring. I'm not quite sure what you mean by intervention. Now, there's, there, there aren't a lot of levers that the Education Authority has in terms of if, if, the, if there was a sense that the Board of Governors was being irresponsible, for instance, with their budget, although that is something that the education, a subcommittee of the Education Committee Board is, is considering, Education Authority Board is considering. Um, well, well I, I'm aware. Are you I'm aware of the school that's making some debt, for instance? And I'm just wondering, you know. Right. Well, I suppose that it's that it's those robust discussions that take place between uh, the education authority and individual schools that would identify. Like some schools are, are have already been identified as unsustainable, so they are invariably going to be running up deficits, and that that will be picked up as part of the area planning arrangements. There are other schools that maybe need to, to make some difficult decisions, but it may take more than a year to see those decisions through. So they, they work closely together on that front. Uh, I, I think perhaps your, your comments are linking back to a reference I made to the fact that the Education Authority ultimately has to pick up the tab in yeah. terms of any deficits they're built up. That's just the reality of, of, of budgeting. Um, so a, a school will obviously the Board of Governors will have to, to make difficult decisions to seek to live within budget, but ultimately deficits have been increasing because there's a wide recognition that schools just haven't had received sufficient funding. But uh, just the way the budgeting system works, the Education Authority ultimately has to pick that up. So in terms of interventions, they're positive interventions as far as possible, robust engagement and working with schools. And I suppose being conscious as, as well that on, uh, we in the department and the educa Education Authority colleagues have been very aware of the pressure that a lot of principals have felt under and it, it has taken a big personal toll at times. So it's working in that environment in as constructive and robust a way as possible without pushing people over the edge either, but working with schools. But as I say, some schools are ultimately unsustainable and that, that's, that will require decisions under the area planning process. Yeah, and I'm just bringing it back to a point in relation to the AOU system, but I noticed as well from points that were made and also within the correspondence that kindly provided that uh, EA are facing pressures of 10.4 million. Um, and, and I'm just conscious of the fact that EA seems to be constantly running out of money. And I'm wondering what mechanisms are being put in place to ensure that they live within their required budget by the Department of Education, because ultimately what is happening here is when schools are running into debt, the IOU system uh, that has been led by the Education Authority is putting them under pressure and then in turn putting the Department of Education under further pressure. And if there isn't, for, uh, if there isn't adequate mechanisms in place to ensure that doesn't happen or a consistent approach, uh, then that gives me some concern about uh, how this can get out of hand, for want of a better description. Uh -huh. Uh, first of all, the 10.4 million that I referred to earlier in terms of the education authority, those are specific COVID-related pressures, so they could, they could never really have uh, uh, foreseen those coming, but th th they were highlighted as, a, as one of our bids. Um, I think the problem, the, the education, well, first of all, by way of assurance, from my point of view in the department, we have a very robust and ongoing um, we have arrangements in place where we robustly engage with the education finance side and the chief executive, challenging uh, on budgeting matters on a regular basis. Uh, so there's no, there's no nothing passive about that. That's a very robust process that we have in place. The challenges that the education authority faces that an awful lot of the, the pressures that they're having to handle are demand-led, such as special education needs, transport costs, uh, so it, it is. They do have genuine challenges there, that that may require, you know, longer term solutions ultimately, and that 
that I think is, is why the thought was being given to, by the education authority to uh, thinking through what a recovery, a longer term recovery plan might look like. Daniel, just, let, just, just let me come in the... there very, very briefly. Sorry. Um, yeah, sure, the, yeah. the minister is um, is scheduled to be with us at eleven o'clock. Okay, I have I right. think, up to four more members to ask questions here, and I'm conscious we haven't touched on capital. If I could ask members to try and keep their resource questions as focused as possible, we we can um, perhaps invite Philip Irwin, director of investment, to return to the committee next week. But I'm conscious there is a budget debate in the Assembly next Tuesday as well. So if, if we can keep our resource questions as concise as possible, we may get to hear briefly from Philip and ask some brief questions around capital as well. If members particularly have capital questions, let me let me know and I can try and move us through the resource questions. You want to finish there, Daniel? Yes, yeah, so just a very uh, a brief point, Chair, and it's relevant to what we've discussed, and, and Gary has already touched on it. It's just in relation to the SEN pressures in the EA, and I, I note that £40 million is earmarked. I'm just concerned, obviously, given what this committee has learned in recent months in relation to uh, the EA's handling of SEN, and considering the, da the recent damning reports about the EA's work, uh, um, is the Department confident that governance arrangements uh, in respect of SEN at the EA are what they should be in this regard? I couldn't really comment on that at the moment. I know that there's a lot going on in the background, but I wouldn't be qualified to comment on that at the moment. Daniel, I know perhaps if, you, if you're content to ask that question of the Minister then, yeah? I am confident. Yeah. I, am confident. I am confident from what I know that uh, Chief Executive is taking forward actions to, to deal with any issues, so the, there is the Department of Confidence on that, but I couldn't comment on the detail. Okay. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. Thanks, yeah. thanks Daniel. Gary, you'll, you'll appreciate um, the need for us to receive reassurances to that regard, given yeah. The, yeah. the scale of that money, which is absolutely needed for saying. Can I bring yeah. in Justin McNulty? Sure. Thanks, Gary, um, Philip, and um, Susan. Thanks for coming on to our committee today. Um, number of questions: Youth work is two million less than last year. Surely, given the impact of COVID-19 and the impact on young people's mental health, additional resource would have been necessary. Any clarity around that, Gary? Sorry, uh, what what are you referring to there? Just if you don't mind me asking. I think there's a figure which shows uh, I've actually lost the now, Gary. So it might take me two. But is there a two million lower bid for youth work or lower figure provided for youth work than last year? Uh, I don't to the detail now, but I, I suppose the point I would make is that. Uh, there's no decision. That's related to a specific bid, presumably, although I'm not quite sure. I can't. There may be some confusion here, Guy. Sorry for cutting in, this is Philip. Um, uh -huh. That may relate to the capital paper. Um, I can talk about that later on, maybe. Is it, was it 12 million to 10 million? Is that what you're the numbers? I think it was 2 million. Sorry, I've got that place. So, uh, Guy. So maybe I will we'll check that and come back to you, maybe, Philip, with you there. Okay, I'll, I'll clarify that. No problem. Um, a bid for 12 to 14 million for a sub teachers hardship fund. Is yeah. there any more detail on that? How it would work? And any indication on time frame for announcement? Sub teachers who have been unpaid for too long and who are really at, at uh, desperate, a desperate place and they need support fast. What is going on? Uh, well, all, all I can say is that a case has been put to the Department of Finance. I know the minister has been engaged, has been engaging with the finance minister. It, it's a very live discussion at the moment, so uh, I think the Minister's desire would be to try and get that, get uh, some decisions around that as soon as possible. Right, well, we'll raise that with the Minister as well, of course. Um, I appreciate the finances are tight and there is a need to prioritise. Are there any bids that the Department of Education has made to the Department of Finance that have already been rejected? For COVID-related responses? Everything. Um, well, I suppose, I mean, we, we submitted the, the full 427 million bids at the outset, so it's not so much, I suppose you could say they're rejected. I think uh, 
the finance minister obviously had to make decisions across the entire block. So it, it was allocating out budgets uh, as realistically as possible. So I'm, yeah, I suppose you could say they were rejected in one sense. We got we got our allocation, but it, it's what was affordable out of the Northern Ireland block for our department. So what can you illuminate in terms of what specifically has been rejected, Gary? Well, if you look at the at, at the long list of bids that we originally submitted, it's not so much that individual bids have been rejected. Uh, we just got less than what we were looking for overall. We got two hundred and twenty seven million as opposed to four hundred and twenty seven. Although some of the bids, the bids have been revised downwards, which reduced that that overall gap. So it's not that specific bids were rejected. It's just that we got a we got a, a budget allocation which didn't meet all of our bids, but it wasn't done. Budget, budget, so you said a budget allocation which is two hundred million less than what you sought. Yeah, yeah, but you asked me the question of which bids were rejected, and I can't answer that specifically because that's not the way that it works when we are allocated a budget as a department. We're allocated a, a, a certain a certain budget envelope, and then it's up to the minister to decide how that is spent. So he then looks again at the bids that we have put forward and prioritises and, and does the best he can within the, the envelope that he's been provided with. Okay, and uh, schools have, a, have no budgets to plan for next year. How will schools be supported with all the additional costs? I'm um, talking about schools, not the education authority. How will the money be allocated? Under what formula? So many schools are already in debt. Uh, it will be done through the, the normal, the common funding formula, and in the normal way through the aggregated schools budget. The amount, the amount that will be, the overall amount that will be allocated is still uh, to be decided by the minister. And hopefully, hopefully, I'll be able to write to schools very soon to give them an indication of what their budgets are. Okay, well, the schools are very keen to get their information. Yeah. Okay, Guy, uh, thanks for your answers. No problem. Thanks, Justin. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Guy. I've been as brief as I can, Chair, and we're running out of time. So, just ask uh, a couple of questions, if that's all right, Gary. And, yeah. Um, at the touch of on what Justin was probably sort of alluding to uh, as well there. So, we have the, the £10 million bid for the development of the mental health and emotional well-being framework uh, previously, and even given the COVID pressures and the pressures that are on uh, the pre-existing uh, mental ill health that was suffered by a lot of people, and probably, um, and we're expecting that that's going to be more, that there's no increase in, in that projected budget, which would concern me slightly at this stage. I mean, all of the things that I'm reading, all of the professional um, uh, work that's been done by clinicians and those that work with children and young people would, would indicate that there is uh, going to be an inevitable mental health pressure on our pupils. So there's, a, there's a really good article in The Lancet, uh, of, that's only a week old, uh, where young minds are showing that 83% of those people who have an existing mental illness in that age bracket are reporting that their conditions are worse. So, I'm just looking, it says here, includes current COVID ask, and I'm just wondering why there's no COVID ask in the mental health uh, and emotional wellbeing framework, because there will be additional pressure. So that's one thing. And the next one's actually, it's, it's, it's closely related to that. And you'll notice that mental health and special education needs are priorities for this committee. Um, and kids with uh, special education needs figure very highly um, in terms of prevalence of mental Ill health, and I see that there is a, and I'm sure there's a good, a good explanation for this one. There's a reduction uh, in the uh, for the implementation of the SEN framework, but they go hand in glove, I think. Yeah. So, so the, the, the question, the, the answer might roll into one, Gary, but the, I, I definitely have a, a, I'm intrigued by that 10 million pound one if it's not increased, uh, given what is definitely going to be a pressure, and then that reduction in the SEN and the, the interrelation between the pressure with mental health with kids with SEN. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the same framework, I'll just comment on that first. I think part of it is with schools closed, it's the deliverability and the time scales that have been affected to a large extent by school closures, so that's part of the reason there. Um, now, the emotional health and well-being department is continuing to work collaboratively with the Department of Health, the Public Health Agency and the Health and Social Care Board, so it's, there is, there's proactive engagement ongoing on this. Um, but again, yeah, some of it's deliverability within timescales and also the bud 
budgetary impact. Now, I can't answer your question as to why there aren't separate bids. Perhaps the Department of Health have highlighted particular pressures uh, in terms of mental and, and emotional well-being. I'm not sure. I can't comment well, on the detail there. But okay. Yeah, I'm not, I, I think in terms of obviously when, when the bids come in, there's a, there's a business case for the bids. I'm just genuine. We, I mean, we have been pushing the minister and the permanent secretary on this to see if they're still on course to deliver the, the framework by December, and it would be more important than ever that something like this is is delivered. And, and I know it's not your ability to draw up the business plans for the bids, but but you need to provide the scrutiny, I suppose. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 it's just something that sits out like a sore thumb to me that given the absolute uh, obvious nature of the pressures that are going to be on young people, I mean, we, we listened yesterday to the uh, Justice <coughs> talking about domestic abuse in the bill and the extended pressures that are on kids at the moment at home uh, who are either subject to abuse or they're in an, an environment where they're maybe self isolating, inside self isolation to protect themselves. Mm. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of kids. And I know what you say, it's a, there, there's an element of Department of Health here. However, when it comes to children and getting them back to school and providing that mental health framework piece, which is in schools, that's 100%. Robbie, Robbie, can, uh, I, Robbie can, I, can I suggest you hold that question for, for the Minister? Um, <laughs> and, and, and genuinely bring that in for the Minister. Um, we're we're sure. almost out of time here. We, Robbie, would you Robbie. forgive me? In, and, of course. And, and allowing um, Catherine and Morris a very short question each to Gary in order to give Philip a very brief moment to make some reference to capital. Uh, Catherine, do you want to ask a, a short question and then Morris? And I'll ask Gary to respond to both of those questions in closing. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Gary. Um, as a response to COVID-19, the department initially sought um, for childcare an additional $24.9 million and received $12 million. Um, it is unclear what period this allocation is intended to cover, um, as the timelines seem to differ between the two departments. Uh, does the department view the allocation of $12 million as an interim payment? Um, and expect to seek and secure a further allocation to meet the initial amount sought? Yes, just to answer that question, um, first, the £12 million is up until the end of June. So, yeah, it, 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 a lot of it's, it's the uncertainty around how long the lockdown will go on and all the rest. So, yeah, we would, we would potentially be seeking for more money then in due, in due course. Okay, thank you. Okay, Catherine, thanks. Uh, and we'll, we can pursue that with the Minister as well. Is Morris there to ask a final question? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Hi, Morris. I will be brief. I will be brief. It's about exams in the CTEA. Uh, my fears all along have been the, the appeal process and how it can be managed. Uh, and I would be concerned that there will be a, a, a massive increase in appeals this year and also applications to reset the exams. In lieu of the reduction of the proposed budget from five million down to one point five million for the CCEA, is that has that taken into account that the there may be more applications to reset and also more appeals? Uh, I think that's a good point. Um, the one point six, I suppose, re reflects the best estimate of what the pressure might be at this stage. But as I understand, there's still discussions and thought being given to the appeals process, so it may well be that there might be an additional pressure there that we might have to bid for. So that's unclear just at this stage. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Gary, can thanks. I just... Uh, Gary, thank you. If, uh, with five minutes, if Philip maybe wants to give us any headlines with regards to capital, and we can maybe um, afford one or two qu short questions in response to the Minister's schedule for 11. Uh, Philip? Yeah. Chair, can I yeah. make one other comment without wanting to steal Philip's thunder? Yeah, very just briefly. Yeah, go ahead. Just a question around the emotional health and well-being and education framework. Just to make it clear, the framework is progressing, currently progressing towards the anticipated time scale of the end of the calendar year, this calendar year. Okay, that's encouraging. Just, just, just in case I confuse the issue there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll be uh, fairly brief, but could I just check one thing, Chair? Um, we have been asked to forward all the information in the same template uh, as Guy had, had used there in the interest of consistency across departments, but that doesn't lend itself to easy explanation. So I had forwarded a separate letter. I just want to check that members have 
that letter in front of him and specifically the table yeah, that's just, in that. Just, just a second, yeah. Clark, where is that located? It's uh, page three of tabled items, members. Page three, tabled items, members. Okay, Phil, thanks. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll stay brief and, and basically focus on that table, um, which is showing the proposed allocations by programme um, for the, the capital allocation that we've received, which this year is 138 million, which is down some... 14.6 million on the equivalent allocation last year. I should say on top of that as well, that's the executive capital. There's also an allocation of 19.1 million for fresh start projects, which is in line with our, our requirements. Um, then by program there, the, the, the table showing the projected outturn for each of the programs for this year and the, the allocations that we have in for uh, the proposed initial allocations for this year. You'll see the major works we're st staying pretty much in line with what was spent last year, albeit that's probably 10 million down on where we would have been in February pre pre COVID, and it probably comes with a, a lot of qualifications around uncertainty, which I'll, I'll maybe speak about at the end. Um, the SEP program then, uh, four million pounds, that, that's probably a lot firmer, but it relates mainly to design work uh, on the, the more recently announced SEPs. Uh, which uh, are not being impacted to the same degree. Uh, the design work isn't being impacted to the same degree as the construction work. The minor works allocation then 64 million, which is built up of 40 million, which we deem to be inescapable. Uh, the, the minimum we just can't go below. And then the remainder is kind of the balancing figure when we've we've allocated across the other programs. Uh, so that balancing figure in this case turned out to be 24 million on top of the 40. Um, youth uh, allocation there is 10 million, uh, which is pretty much in line with where youth spend has been over the last uh, number of years. Um, and then finally, there's a bit of a step up in what's deemed other capital, and the big drivers in that are ICT and transport, and there are a couple of um, large business cases currently with the department from the EA, um, which would would uh, anticipate spending in year. Uh, reasonably significant uh, chunky figures uh, on, on those projects. So that, that, that's the total, uh, that's the, the summary of the, the allocations. Um, as, as I was saying earlier on, the, the whole thing is, is characterised by uncertainty. Currently, none of our projects from minor works, youth, major works, are on site. Uh, and there's uncertainty around the date that um, uh, contractors will return, albeit we're aware that uh, a number are making plans to come back in May, um, but there's also a lot of uncertainty around when they come back, they will be implementing social distancing uh, protocols, and it's very uncertain as to the degree to which that will impact on their ability to progress projects, which again will impact on, on spend and on the budget. There's also an impact um, from the, the EA staffing side, where staff who have been involved in the capital delivery um, process have been reallocated to deal with immediate issues and pressures um, in relation to COVID. And again, there's some uncertainty as to when they will return and uh, the scale of the impact that them being away has had. So for that reason, we're, we're deeming those allocations to be initial allocations. Obviously, in any year, we, we manage by programme and we'll move money around as and when pressures appear or um, uh, there are slippage in programmes. But I suspect in this particular year it's going to be a particularly fluid situation and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be, be moving money around quite, quite a bit depending on, on how things pan out with uh, the, the whole pandemic. Um, and uh, just as a final point, really, we've probably gone from a point where that total budget allocation was maybe 10 to 15 million less than we would have been comfortable with to uh, a, a situation where the big issue for us might be actually being able to deliver all of this, given the, the fact we're going to lose probably most of the first quarter of the year in terms of construction, and we've got all these inefficiencies in terms of um, staffing and so on. Um, so, um, uh, you know, basically it's, it's, it's uh, a lot of this is speculation at this point. Hopefully we'll get into a, a position where things are firmer over the next couple of months as contractors go back, but um, the whole thing is characterised by uncertainty at the moment.
Okay, Phil, thank you. Members, the, the Minister is obviously with us at 11 here. Um, could I um, ask Philip if he would be content for us to submit written questions uh, to him that he could perhaps endeavour to come back to us on prior to our, the debate next Tuesday? Um, are members content or does anyone have a, a super urgent um, matter? Sure, just that two million there. The two million I mentioned earlier, that's, that's where it came from. Where it used last year was 12 million, and this year, the next year, 10 million. So, oh, just, okay, just, just before you come back, Philip, um, anyone else, sorry. any really urgent capital questions for Philip to respond to, or content for us to submit them in writing? No, content. Content, okay. So, Philip, why has the, the youth capital budget reduced from 12 to 10? Well, it's, it's, it's not that the, the, the 10 million to the initial allocation, we will, we will, I mean, the reason it would have reduced, I suppose, is, is driven by the projects that we have in the pipeline and what we think can be delivered. We're going to lose the first quarter of the year here, no matter what, so it's going to be slightly less than uh, it would have been in, a, in an equivalent year. However, if we can find a way to accelerate those projects, as I said, I suspect any of these programs where we can do more, the money will be available to, to, to accelerate them. Okay. Okay. Officials, thank you very much indeed for your, your briefing today. We, we will submit further written questions to you given time has beaten us. Uh, hopefully you could endeavour to come back to us on those prior to the debate next Tuesday. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay. Thank, thank you. Okay, well members, obviously the committee uh, must agree a position in respect of the budget for the forthcoming plenary debate uh, and in order to advise the committee for finance. Members content for us to return to that matter after the, the briefing with the minister here, yes? Agreed. Okay, thanks. Agreed. Okay then, members, agenda item six is uh, our session with the, the minister. Uh, page 25 of table papers includes an updated copy of the Department of Education uh, situation report. Uh, a briefing paper from the committee clerk is page 134 of the meeting pack. Uh, Department of Education response in respect of child care is at page 194. And DE correspondence on further notices made under the Coronavirus Act is at page 20, or sorry, 203. Can I confirm that we have the Minister for Education, Peter Weir, uh, Permanent Secretary Derek Baker, and Deputy, Deputy Secretary John Smith with us? Yeah, good, good morning, Committee. It's the Minister. Uh, uh, Derek Baker here, Chair. Morning, everyone. Good morning, I, I Chair. A very, very brief welcome to you all. And invite, I realise your time is short uh, due to the executive meeting at 12 o'clock. Um, can I invite you to make uh, short opening comments and then take questions yeah. from members? Thank you, Chair. I'll be here until about 20 to 12, uh, but if there's a uh, way to get a sort of a reaction here, but if there's uh, questions beyond that, then obviously the Permanent Secretary will be able to... Yeah, if we, if we, all, if we all try to stay as concise as possible. Thank you, Minister. Okay. Then, run through this very, very quickly then. Uh, obviously, people have got the update. Just to highlight a few issues. First of all, uh, formally, the pay offer to uh, teachers as regards that has now been bothered on and been accepted. We've got formal notification. Uh, from TNC on that. Um, secondly, obviously yesterday we were able to issue decisions uh, following advice from CCA on both occupational studies qualifications and the CCA uh, entry level uh, qualifications uh, in terms of methodology. While there's ongoing work with CCA, we are um, working closely with, with schools to try to be able to provide all the guidance that is there. In terms of uh, overall decisions, uh, that need to be made, uh, those are basically all the main decisions with regard to exam that lie purely within the competence of um, education. There will be other things that the economy will still be, be working on. Um, Childcare is moving ahead. Uh, we're working with BSO and we hope uh, very shortly to be able to make uh, the application process, particularly as regards childcare organisations available in the very near future. That's with business service organisations. Uh, on the children, um, we're working with EA, and EA now has agreed that uh, in terms of the range of um, provision that they are making uh, through a range of outreach um, sort of uh, mechanisms, uh, that they will then be able to produce sort of a weekly uh, update of that um, so that sort of all that information is gathered together. Uh, specifically, also, we're also working with uh, particularly uh, health and social care uh, and EA on uh, special, uh, special education 
to get sort of uh, an integrated team there to be able to provide that level of, of support. Uh, on distance learning, we've included, we're trying to bottom out what further needs to happen in terms of distance learning, in terms of particularly both provision and support of, of kids. So we've asked some more detailed questions from the survey that went out on Friday. That will help us gather. We've already got a reasonable amount of information back from that, um, not just uh, to what is needed, but perhaps why it's needed. And there are, as regards to kids, some within the, the system. We want to make sure that if there's stuff that needs then to be brought in to be lent out to children in whatever time frame that, that, that it's got to be done something that's an effective manner. And I know, for instance, some organisations, the West Belfast uh, Learning Community, uh, used funds which it got from the Department of Education some time ago to uh, purchase equipment and have actually distributed uh, some of that. Uh, free school meals, the second tranche of payments have gone out, I think, covering about 98,000. Third, sorry, third has gone out today type of thing in relation to that, uh, covering, I think, about 98,000. Uh, and those who are still, uh, I suppose one of the issues just a little bit is that there will be still some who are uh, issues around bank accounts. That's for a range of reasons. And we're continuing to, to work with those. I suppose also from a processing point of view, uh, albeit uh, at a rate which is not sort of overwhelming, uh, there are obviously additional people coming into the system. So those are obviously new details which are needed to be uh, to be sought. Um, and also, I suppose, uh, one other issue, I think, to a couple of other issues to mention. Uh, there's also now, I think, availability in terms of the widening of the testing facilities. So for those who are working in schools, who are in schools, physically present in schools for uh, children of, of key workers and vulnerable children, in terms of the provision of testing, that has now been widened by the Department of Health to include uh, those people in a range of others. Uh, I suppose, and final point just I want to make, uh, the uh, offers that are going out then in terms of preschool and primary school are on track. I think actually a lot of them are due out, uh, primary schools are due out today. Uh, and also we're working with uh, EA uh, on the issue of the post-primary transfer, uh, which initially there was concerns over, but I think we've, we've rolled that back in so that the range of measures uh, should mean that there should be minimal delay on that, if, if any, in connection. So those are the main uh, highlights, Chair, but uh, myself and Permanent Secretary and John are happy to read whatever questions anybody wants to ask. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll kick us off then um, on the post-primary transfer matter that you alluded to there, Minister. Um, obviously, the public health emergency presents significant challenge to um, the preparation for post-primary transfer test schedule for November, and that preparation would normally be underway in April, May and June um, of, of this year. Um, during which time schools are obviously closed to help people stay at home and save lives. Uh, despite the best endeavours of teachers and families, um, pupils are going to have variable capacity for an access to distance learning, different internet and computer resources, different parental and guardian working hours. Uh, some will have two parents or guardians who are both key workers. So parents are understandably questioning whether this is a, a level playing field of, of preparation. So my, my question would be, do you accept that this variable capacity for distance learning during the months of April, May and June presents uh, an unfairness for pupils scheduled to sit tests in November? Well, I think it provides an additional, uh, additional pressure. I, I suppose you should point out two things. First of all, I'm sure you're aware, in terms of the opening remarks, uh, when I was talking about the post-primary transfer, I was kind of specifically talking about the timetable for the post-primary transfer for 2020. Okay. You should remember that that hasn't actually happened um, as yet. It's not due to happen for the next couple of weeks. And I suppose the very first bit is around the processes of that because that has been more challenging, uh, I should say, as an aside, because uh, in the last year or two, uh, EA, for instance, has been able to move into an entirely online system for both the... Uh, primary and the preschool, whereas the, the post-primary transfer has tended to be more paper-based. Now, there are mitigating measures we've been able to put in place. So that has been challenging to meet that specific. But turning as opposed to the 2021 uh, period, yeah. there, there, are, there are things which are challenges within the, the system. I would point out, first of all, as regards um, the timing and indeed methodology that AQE and PPTC uh, use within the, the post-primary transfer, 
obviously these are independent organisations, so therefore, while there are ongoing discussions with these organisations, ultimately, in terms of timing, that is something that, that they have um, under their control. It's noticeable, I think, that, uh, that in terms of the application process that has been put back, I think, uh, by about a fortnight um, in relation to that. So there's, there's ongoing work to try and see where we can put a level of, of, um, uh, of as much fairness as possible within the, uh, within the system. Is, is any system perfect? No, I, I don't think it is. Um, having said that, like, and again, I know there will be big chasm in terms of where various people, including myself, um, on the committee uh, will be in terms of their, their approach on this. Uh, I'd indicate, obviously, I'm somebody that supports academic selection, um, and I think it's also the case that from the point of view of what can be offered, an exam is ultimately always better than a form of assessment. And so even, for instance, where we've dealt with the issue of DCSEs, A-levels, AS-levels, um, you know, I think it would certainly be acknowledged by CCA if they've been in a position to put in exams. That's, that's what they'd have gone for as their, their first option. So okay, if we're working well, with... Let, let, let me ask you, do, do you support the lay of the tests? Uh, I think in terms of... I, I can understand why people are calling for that. And I'm, from that point of view, I'm open to see what suggestions are there in terms of, in terms of time scale. I think it may well lead to a level of, uh, some level of delay within that. And I can understand the argument says that in terms of preparation time, people may require a degree of preparation time. Okay, I'm, I'm going to, 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 like, to end. Oh, sorry, hold on, hold on. Okay, go it's ahead. Important, it's important because, sorry, it's important that people understand this because there is also a balancing thing with this. Not everybody realizes it. On the, up, on the far end of it, though, uh, delay also then though, does create a level of problems in terms of trying to make sure that we have a, a, a sustainable time scale between people receiving results and those results being able to process into uh, into a, a, a transfer process, which means that people can be placed fully in. And that, so it's about balancing out those those two things. It does because from the first tests are normally sat in November. The I find the process finishes at, at the end of May, taking seven months. So to to when do you suggest the tests are delayed? No, I'm not. I'm not suggesting. It's not our place to suggest that. And what I'm saying is, you're, you're I can be, understand. You're be, Minister, you're being asked to facilitate the delay of tests, are you not? No, with respect, with respect in relation to that, as a department and EA's role, for instance, is the processing once results have, have, have happened. And our role is to try to make sure, uh, and indeed, whatever one's opinion on how we reach that point, that whenever people have results. But those are then able to be processed into placements and trying to, to ensure that that mechanism, and that involves a bit of discussion with the organisations. But, you know, from that point of view, we do not have control over, uh, and indeed do not seek to have control over, the dates in which particular tests are held. That is a matter purely for AG. So the point I'm making earlier is I can perfectly understand the argument that will be there, and it's the case, it's a very reasonable argument from a lot of parents, for instance, or a lot of people out there who will say, given the current circumstances, will there be, if things simply move ahead in November, will there be the same level of preparation? Uh, will that have some level of impact? Yes, it is likely to do that. So I think there's a reasonable argument which says uh, that uh, delay may well be needed, but it's not a question of us particularly facilitating that or <coughs> in any way sort of making that particular thing happen. Okay. They're trying to make Whatever, yep. whatever consequences or whatever there is something that's manageable then for uh, the system to be able to, to deal with. And again, to try to make sure that as much as possible, pupils are able to be placed uh, quickly in the, in the appropriate school for them uh, come uh, 2021. Okay, so that I'd keen to obviously move on let other people come in, but uh, as much as a, a one-month delay takes the process that normally finishes on May 30th to June 30th, when schools are then closed... Um, so I, I think this is an urgent matter um, that, that needs it addressed. Can I, can I ask what, what other we, we options... Are, we are sorry? sorry, I can ask what other options are being scoped? And you say you don't have power with regards to the uh, non-statutory test. That is obviously correct. You do have other power. So is not using tests as criteria for post-primary admissions being scoped? But no, no, they're not, because there are a couple of reasons in relation to it. First of all, let me make it clear, I will not be abolishing the right of schools to use academic selection as a method to uh, 
select at post primary level. And again, I appreciate there's a sort of wide division on that, that subject depending upon who you're talking to. So let me say that. In terms of criteria, I think that uh, if we feel that there may be difficulties that would be created and it's a suboptimal position uh, as regards other exams where there's going to have to be a level of, of teacher assessment, I think to put teachers in a position where uh, they would have to make judgments on P7 pupils in terms of assessment, not only suboptimal because I think that's not as good as an exam for the stop on it, uh, it would place them in an invidious position. It would also, from the point of view of the pupils, given the fact that there is a wide divergence of views in terms of selection, I think what that would create would be a chaotic system, because in part, either because of the concern over the pressure, or perhaps in some cases because simply a, a, failure, a failure to support or accept selection taking place on that, that, that basis, I think you would have, it would risk uh, widespread um, lack of support, lack of cooperation, and you would then have a situation where it would happen in some schools but not in others. And really for the system to work, it's got to be something which anybody seeking that selection has got to be able to avail of. So I don't think that that is a realistic option. It is not one that, from the point of view of putting other, other bits in criteria, we will be working with others. Some of the issues are outside our control, but we're working with others to try to make sure that we have a manageable system as possible and as fair a system to people as possible. Okay, well, we would we'd appreciate more detail as to what that is going to look like, given that preparation for this process is normally now underway and normally takes approximately seven months, starting in November. You'll appreciate that parents are in search of greater clarity than that which you've given uh, and, today. And, let, and let's, also, let's also remember, Chair, that uh, for quite a number of years, until actually a change was made in the last mandate by myself, Schools were actually sent out a memo until late 2016 saying that they would have no role whatsoever in any form of preparation for this, that they were not in any way to assist their pupils in preparing for this. So perhaps we're into a situation in the short term, which is akin to the position that was actually in place for many years. Uh, but that is not what any of us want to see happening in, in relation to that. So we're continuing to work with uh, organisations and as soon as there's a greater level of certainty on that, and I appreciate people's desire for certainty, then that will be made very clear. Okay, you've given me a fair window on that, Minister. Very briefly, before I bring members in, uh, an important issue is provision for children with complex needs. Uh, the Permanent Secretary mentioned previously that hopefully a, a case management system is being put in place to ensure that children with complex needs um, are getting the support they need, whether at home or by way of a return to special school. Can you give us any more detail as to how exactly that case management system is going to operate and when that would be in place? I'll pass over directly to the Permanent Secretary on this one. Chair, um, yeah, I mentioned that last week that it was something we were thinking about and you picked it up and, I, um, you know, you supported the concept. Um, we've kind of changed the terminology uh, to an interdisciplinary panel, but it's the same kind of concept. That has been accepted by all parties, but we are now working through the, or, sorry, the health professionals and the educational professionals are working through the modalities of how the panel will operate. And in particular, I think you mentioned last week the importance of uh, families' wishes being input to that process and how that will be accommodated. So that detail is being worked out as we speak. I hope it will be bottomed out in the next day or two, and I hope that those um, panels can start to be scheduled so that the needs of those individual children can be examined and accommodated. They haven't started yet. Uh, we've been looking at the detail over the, over the past number of days, but it will happen. Okay, thank you. Can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Minister and uh, Permanent Secretary. Um, Minister, for your time again this morning um, and for your continued um, updates um, for the department's progress in the work. Each week we're going through it. That being said, I still have some issues that continue to be unresolved, so I'm just going to go over a few here. Uh, we, again, I suppose one of the biggest lobbies that we continue to get on a daily day basis is the teachers, um, the substitute teachers uh, pay those who are day to day. Um, who are still awaiting. Now, we have got the briefing this morning in relation to the bud, um, and we are aware that um, there's options that have been worked up. 
But I was wondering if you could provide us with the status on that and when we'd be likely to hear of an outcome to be able to inform people who are contacting us. Well, Karen, uh, you're right in terms of uh, there have been options that have been worked up. We've been working with DOF on this for quite a period of time. We put in a general submission as regards pieces um, of as part of the overall package of the, the COVID measures. Uh, and in addition to that, there's other options that, that are being um, worked up. I think, to be fair, uh, in terms of pure timing, uh, I think part of the issue is that I think with any of the options don't particularly lie in the Department of Education's control. It would depend on if we were to get the best solution that's, that's available or any one of a couple of solutions for substitute teachers, it will require some level of additional support from outside the Department of Education. If there's something the Department of Education has to do purely itself, then it would be at a, it, there isn't a that the finance that to be there. So there's a bit of a trade-off, if you like, between and we want to at least exhaust any other options that can lever in that additional support while giving people a certainty. So there is a bit of a trade-off. Look, I hope that there could be a situation that very soon we can uh, reach some level of resolution. I think uh, the problem is if, if, if I had to jump today, then I'd, jump, I'd have to jump to a solution which would be less favourable than one that may or may not be available in a short period of time. So that's the great trade-off um, in connection with that. To be fair, the AOF have worked closely with us on it. I think the problem in terms of the overall element of, of bids is there's a, it, it's a very merited bid. Uh, nobody is doubting that. But against what available resources are there to the executive as a whole, there are a very large number of bids that are in. Uh, the yeah. vast bulk are very well merited, and there's a lot of people chasing what is globally proportionately a smaller amount of money in that, in that basis. So that's where I think some of the difficulties lie with that. I understand the pressures that there. Maybe if we could get um, uh, a line of communication going back to substitute those teachers who are affected and maybe give them that update um, on it uh, um, would be helpful. I'm not sure if we can, but I understand. Yeah. I, think, I think the issue just in, in some regards is, yeah, the generality of, yes, bits have been put in, there are options being considered that it will require, if we're to get the best result, it requires some level of support from outside the department. Um, I think the problem beyond that is there are probably sensitivities around negotiations um, that uh, would not necessarily, if everything just was in the public domain at the moment, yeah. would be necessarily 100% yeah. helpful. So that, that, there's limitations on the amount of information yeah. that can be yeah. just correct at this stage. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. I text me on to my next question, and I see that there's a bill down there around the pathways funding. I have been consistently raising this every week and been in contact with you from between, and we had a conversation on it last week. I'm still being told yesterday that um, uh, groups are still uncertain. This is a full month where people have been left without an income. Um, again, can I get a status on where that is sitting? I'll be, I'll be, but I, I, again, looking at correct me if I'm wrong. So basically any of the outside bodies which would have included the, the pathway side of it, totality. if the totality has been has been effectively the same amount that was there last year is there uh, in will be there in the twenty twenty one budget and notwithstanding there are elements of the budget that have not been able to be finalised because some of it depends upon um, what level of external funding happens in terms of the COVID side of it. Uh, we've written out to and confirmed up to basically any of the, um, both the NDPBs, um, with the exception of SIA, who there's a little bit of an issue which we're working through in terms of costing some of the exam side of it, to the NDPBs and third parties indicating that their budget will be the same for 2021. That, that element has been able to be guaranteed. Now, work pathways in a slightly different position. I'll caveat my earlier remarks just with something else in a moment. Uh, work pathways in a slightly different uh, position is each year that's effectively a competitive process. So you yeah. will get speaking, the same number of groups that are funded, but because of the way that, that they are assessed and therefore ranked, it means each year some people, uh, for the vast majority, will get the same funding again. Some will effectively fall out of the, the system, some will come in. But because of the yeah. competitive yeah. process, um, it's not really a position simply of saying, well, those that have fallen out, we'll give them some extra money, into next year, because that would actually be unfair on, for instance, a new group that applied and might well have ended up as runner-up in the overall process. Um, yeah. So there's that side of it. The one other caveat I would add to that is 
the groups have been, uh, in terms of information that has been been given, um, and again, I, I don't know whether this has simply been at the global level or this has been rolled down to, to other groups. The one exception in terms of, call it third party organisations, uh, Sure Start, uh, which there was a case made that effectively to stand still, they required roughly about one and a half million pounds extra uh, this year. That one and a half million pounds uh, indications we've given indications that that will be made available to Sure Start. So the Sure Start budget itself in cash terms is up for everybody else uh, amongst a range of organisations, uh, particularly where they are directly funded by the, the, by the Department of Education. Um, indication has been given that there is the same amount of money that has been made available to them this year. Now, there will be some organisations who receive their money by way of ring fence funding by the Education Authority, and there are certain decisions. I, I mean, I'll tell you the EA will probably roll those forward, but strictly yeah. speaking, those are decisions to the EA, so we can't actually um, contact directly those organisations. Yeah, I suppose I, I have laboured this point over and over again, and I've put it on the written uh, correspondence, particularly around pathways. This is not uh, uh, the usual situation where we run and do competitive nature and funding. These groups have been left in this crisis that they cannot apply for funding elsewhere. The staff that was employed, and it's very, very minimal, cannot get all their jobs and are really much less in limbo. The request was that, it would con that there would be support continued on to the end of June. All our funders and departments have been able to do this. So I again would appeal that you would look at it. I have correspondence on the Eric, if you want to come back to me on it, because I don't want to pick up this very short okay, period that we have. I'm going to move on to, to my next one. Um, just again, in the Aaron, the only issue I've just made is two points. One, uh, there may be an argument that leaves us vulnerable if we are, for instance, rolling forward. Uh, I think the vast bulk of organisations, they, they are continuing to receive funding. Uh, Pathways is on an April-to-April -April basis and has always been uh, yeah. that way. The problem, I think, was rolling forward um, on that. You know, I think the amount of money may be something that uh, would be considered. But it would be a break from what, and I appreciate we're in very difficult circumstances. I guess the problem is if we're providing part-year funding to people who may well, on a, on a competitive process, have been ranked below um, organisations which have applied perhaps for the first time and been ranked above them but not received funding. Yeah. I think that makes it a level of difference. Yeah. We do have, in terms of trying to uh, provide a little bit of better opportunity for Pathways, we do have a bid, given the circumstances that is directly in uh, yeah. to, uh, to the executive. But again, that amongst other bids is one of those which has not been able to be met so far. So that, that is the problem, uh, problem with that. Yeah, yeah, that's a, no bother, that's grand, thank you. Um, Child here, uh, again, I know um, Catherine will probably come on it, we've consistently raised this every week, and uh, we got an update there earlier again around the buzz and all of that there. But, and in your own briefing, Minister, you did say that this week um, that the applicant, no, the, uh, in, the, in the written update we've got that the detail would come out this week, we got that last week, You've said today applications will be out soon. Uh, I am really concerned that this childcare situation is not sorted out. It is rolling on. We are being inundated by healthcare workers who have not obviously been contacted by their employer to tell them the process. Uh, we're directing them through that. And yesterday I spoke with a provider in my city and he told me that early years or the Department of Health could not give him any details for him to be open able to open up and provide the child care to the staff at the hospital. He actually has a child care facility at the hospital here in this city. He can't open it up. They don't know who to turn to. Um, they don't know what support is there. We were to get a wee bit more detail from last week's meet meeting. I don't believe that we got it um, in relation to that and what they're entitled to. I know there's some information on the pack there. Um, but, you know, I know education is a partner and you're heavily funding it, but if health is under too much pressure to administer this, I think it needs to be addressed um, uh, immediately. Okay. There, obviously, in terms of if you like, the two elements of contact, the contact with, uh, for instance, the trust to staff and the details within the thing, uh, ultimately they're, they're having a, a bit concerned if, if what we're saying is there may be a little bit of teething problems that, that side of it. I suppose one of the things perhaps in the wider context we find sometimes is that, that sometimes within the trust situation you can get a slightly sporadic situation depending upon uh, where that is. 
but very specifically in terms of the wider scheme, we mentioned that, that we would anticipate uh, that this will be very clear this week. This is Wednesday. Uh, I would anticipate that uh, we should put in a position that there will be, particularly for childcare providers, in terms of the full details of the scheme, uh, business service organisation, uh, BSO has been taking that forward. We would anticipate that happening by the weekend in relation to that, so it shouldn't be a good deal longer to, to wait in relation to that. Uh, I mean, and look, I should point out, um, I suppose there was, I think in terms of um, childcare provisions elsewhere, I know it's taken maybe sometimes five or six weeks to, to set up. Uh, by the end of this week, it'll be about three weeks. We hope then to have uh, everything in place uh, by that. But obviously, as part of the stuff as well is, um, unlike perhaps, say, some other schemes, which are there, say, in the economy side of it, rates where effectively you've almost got a bespoke solution, which you just need simply to apply. This is a bit more complex in terms of it's something that is fairly unprecedented, particularly as regards to the issue of um, the sustainability support, because that's a key element of that as well for um, facilities which are currently having to be closed. But we want them to be in a position to reopen uh, whenever there is a greater opportunity that's, that's there. It is very complicated, but we're anticipating that, that everything from the point of view of announcements should be over the line by the weekend. Yeah, thank you. And Thanks, Chair, this is my last. Uh, just Bannister there in relation to IT equipment. Um, uh, laptop support for families who do not have one. We've given a bit of a briefing. Again, I've consistently raised it. We were told last week we would get more detail on what EA um, is doing. Um, I just see in the update they're looking at, currently looking at options to supply devices. Um, uh, we are now entering the month of May. We're already aware of children falling behind and we know to school for seven weeks. Um, uh, and there's a very short period left. So um, just, like, it, it's really, really important that the department addresses this and ensures that the work that the EA is doing is very time-bound and we get that support out um, uh, to those children and young people who need it. Well, it is, but look, we've also got to make sure that, that uh, again, sort of proper processes are in place to ensure there's accountability in, in relation to that. As I said, we had asked very specific questions uh, in terms of the survey bit on Friday. Um, that gives, it gives us probably a ballpark figure of where the shortages are. I, I suppose we're also seeing a bit of qualitative um, as well as the quantitative side of it. What we are finding um, is uh, that in terms of shortages, it is probably less it is less frequent that you get a situation where a family simply doesn't have a device. It is um, an issue of where there is pressure within the family that where you have a number of, of people trying to use maybe one or two devices. I think that's where the, the pressure lies. There are some within the system, I think, which are looking to uh, use that. Look, it is also the case, because we don't know whether or not in terms of time scale on this, uh, in terms of what needs to be put in place, whether sort of moving ahead at a future point uh, there may need to be some degree of mixture of school learning and remote learning, depending upon how they, these things pan out. So we want to have a, a wider game plan on that side of it as well. If that means, uh, and I know caught the tail end of the, the briefing side of it, if it means we use what is within the system, we use sort of um, what can be provided and lent, which may well be sufficient, but if there's a need, for instance, say, for additional purchase of tablets as part of that, you know, there can be a little bit of capital to be that, that side of it, particularly in circumstances which that may, capital may not be fully able to be delivered in 2021 as well. So there's all those to be of options. Yeah. We're trying to actually bottom out to get okay. the details. Okay. We want to make sure the interest is Okay. No, Minister, I can just tell you, I suppose, in my city, other than the fact that um, they have two or three devices in the house and the broadband's been picking up, it's the fact that they don't have a device. Um, we've already done that, I've done that piece of work with the uh, post primary non selectors in the city. They would already be aware of those young people. Um, they've been able to source, I suppose, uh, some, but they would have it there. So I'd be most concerned about the young people who have no devices. They're maybe operating off a phone, and then we're dealing with um, people who are not connected through bad broadband and things like that. So, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll appreciate the, the work that's being done, um, but we're making sure that it's at yeah. least one device. And the issue, the issue around broadband comes to a wider issue, which we're working yeah. with. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. In terms of remote learning, because I suppose with the best one in the world, if you're getting some geographical patches to like Northern Ireland where there's very poor broadband, which is part of the overall proposal to roll out broadband. 
Uh, most of the schools involved with that will have then uh, tried to compensate for that by way of uh, paper learning on that on that basis. Uh, but this is about about trying to establish what is needed and what the right solutions are. Because again, yeah. if we take one example, providing a bit of kit to somebody who doesn't broadband in their area isn't going to be a great deal of use to them either. In, in kind of but obviously, I, I appreciate the work that you've done within, yeah. within your own city, uh, on a card. I suppose as part of that, we're trying to establish what the overall position across Northern Ireland is. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Okay, Carl. No, no bother. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. thanks, Minister. Okay. Uh, members, time is beating us, and I have failed uh, to order time well. <coughs> there are six members left, okay? Member, uh, or Minister, if you would bear with me and indulge me, if I could give each of those members an opportunity to ask one single concise question, okay, each, and then have your response to those questions, or if, if members honour this and ask a really short, concise question each. I will try and get everyone one question to the minister, um, and then we can try and get them away. So, Robin, will you use your experience to lead me well on this direction? <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister, for, for again briefing us today. It, it is uh, a very short question, and it ties in with the question from the de final chair, question from the deputy chair. You'd indicated about the success, overall success, of the distance learning program, uh, and indeed sometimes the need to back that up with paper uh, programs. Um, when pupils return to school in September, it looks like now, um, will there be any assessment before they move into their new year, new uh, teacher, new form, and so on? in order to assess what progress overall they have made? Well, I think as part of that would be working on an overall recovery program, which part of that would be to try to establish uh, what gaps there are in terms of learning, at what level of, um, what point people have reached. So, yeah, whether you, whether you call it a formal assessment or not, but certainly there would be indication. I suppose one of the issues would be, depending upon where particular schools are, it may be that we get a... The landscape across Northern Ireland is not identical from school to school. Yeah, quick supplementary there, Mr. Newton. It's Derek Baker here. Yes, um, as, as the Deputy Chair mentioned, the, the committee is still owed a piece of paper on the detailed arrangements for continuity of learning, and that will come. Um, but as part of that broader program of work, um, as the Minister says, we are looking ahead to what will be needed if and when schools return to some level of normality to take account of what has happened in the intervening period. Okay, so it's not Derek, just the hearing, Derek, it's looking at... Sorry? Derek, can I check? You're OK to stay with us when the Minister leaves? Yeah, yeah. I, I am, Chair. Okay. I can stay. Can I bring Daniel McCrossan in to ask a question of the Minister? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, uh, as well, for being with us today. It's, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, I'm going to ask about AS, but just before I do so, Minister, I know you have uh, been working hard on the supply teachers, and, and I hope that there is some resolution to this, because many of the supply teachers I'm speaking to on a daily basis are telling us that after their hard work and getting qualified and then assisting in schools, that they feel very much used and abandoned in this current situation, which is beyond their control. That aside, Minister, just in terms of AS, um, I know that uh, there's been quite a uh, significant concern out there amongst uh, uh, parents and students in relation to uh, the decision around uh, AS. Um, it has the potential to put massive pressure on students by making the A2 exams even more high stake than they already are at a time when normal teaching is being seriously disrupted and the online alternative untested uh, as to its effectiveness. And obviously we've mentioned about the uh, broadband provision. I don't need to speak any further than Straban Roma uh, to use as an example. It is proving to be a, a difficulty and of concern. Will you, Minister, reconsider and permit all AS grades awarded in the same manner as GCSE and A2 grades in 2020 to be carried forward and contribute in the normal way to next year's A2 final grade, as you'll appreciate? This is a big, big issue, uh, Minister, and we are being inundated with concerns. I, in I, 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 I understand. I'll not talk to the teacher you've heard me mention. No, the, the complication with that is we have a system which can produce, it is the best possible system that can be found, but it can produce basically a grade. Now, there are two complications with that in terms of taking that forward on the basis of decoupling. Firstly, you will have a grade rather than a mark. 
And if you're looking to make an assessment of 40% of your mark, as has been the case up until now, applying into A2, how do you grade, how do you produce a mark for, say, for instance, somebody, how do you get 40% of a B, for instance, for the that issue? But also, here's, here's the other complication. Everybody, in terms of decoupling, um, everybody who's doing ASs across the UK is, will now be on exactly the same basis and will be on exactly the same basis for their uh, A2 remark in 2021, uh, which means that the, the, the mark in 2021 will be purely effectively an examination mark on that, on that basis, which is the same as, as elsewhere. That's effectively where that will come as a competitive route for universities. Now, if we have a Northern Ireland situation, which is partly based on an examination and partly based on an earlier assessment, there is a danger that that will not be considered as robust as uh, people in, who are competing for university places. It's noticeable, and I had a conversation um, with, uh, with the other education ministers across the UK. Wales has until now been in an identical position to us in terms of the way that they have used AS as, uh, as part of the overall A2 result. Uh, Wales, like ourselves, came to the same conclusion uh, that this year, for this year alone, there had to be decoupling. It was the only way, way forward. It is not the perfect solution because the perfect solution would be exams going ahead, but th there isn't, there isn't uh, a way which really this can be uh, rejigged in any way to, to take that into account. I appreciate the concerns that, that, that are out there, and I know some people have raised those particular concerns there, but we went through all the options and there isn't really an alternative. Daniel, important question, well asked. Can I ask for a question from Robbie Butler? That would get us around all the parties at least. Robbie? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, a couple of questions. We're only going to go one, one chair, okay. Um, it's just, and I'm sorry to go back to it, um, Minister, um, because the chair and yourself have talked at, at extended length about the um, post primary transfer. Um, uh, EA and PPTC have indicated that they would prefer to um, uh, defer the date. Um, and, and I understand that you, would, you did in your answer say that it's a matter for EA and a matter for those groups, but you also stated that it was your preference. Oh, sorry, AQE, Ron, yeah. Sorry, yes, yes, AQ, thank you. But you did, um, you know, and I've accepted this from, from the outset that it is your intention to keep that academic selection there, and that's, that's your prerogative as a minister. However, um, the parents and children are um, going to have a, an extended period of worry given the answers today. Um, was indicated that uh, both groups had written out to EA and yourself. So I, I do believe there is a role for you to play to provide some assurance, and I would ask that you would do that today as a matter of urgency um, to provide clarity. I don't accept that there is a need for that extended period post the exam for the, the results, and, and, and I think that can all be shortened. So, uh, but just I'll ask you for that today. Uh, Robbie, not with, not with you. I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you in terms of. I think part of the issue is looking at the processes from the point at which an exam takes place to the final placement and trying to make sure that if we are in a difficult position because of timing, uh, that if there's any actions that can be taken, which while keeping the integrity of the process alive, um, ensures that things can move in a quicker bit. And we've seen that to some extent with this year's placement. So there's been a little bit of, of rejigging of processes, which have meant that, that where potentially there were delays be taken out of the system. So I don't, I don't disagree with that. Look, we are aware both of the urgency of the issue and the importance of the issue. We don't have control over it. However, you're right in terms of there has been contact and there is ongoing contact between the department um, and the, the two organisations in particular. Uh, and therefore, it's important that we try to bring as much certainty, particularly for, for parents and for children, uh, as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, Minister, I Thanks. presume you're probably out of time there, are you? But if there's, I could take, I could take one more if you want, but I'll have to head up. Okay. Uh, I'll have to head up today. Yeah, we've got Justin Morris and Catherine left. If, if, if okay. you can all be Thanks. super, Thanks, super sir. concise, then you might get a question. Justin? Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, quick one, Peter. Uh, you know, we've dealt with student teachers, or sorry, substitute teachers quite a bit. And the minds are ready, but I'm still not clear. There's too much vagueness around the answers. Um, let's talk about a young pregnant uh, substitute teacher who's four months pregnant and she's, told, she's been told she's high risk. What does she do? Does she do without any salary for her, her the duration of her pregnancy? 
She's very, very scared. What do, what do young couples who are two substitute teachers who are trying to save to build their home, who haven't been paid for seven weeks, and who have no um, clarity around any supports or any hardship funds, when is the money going to be forthcoming? What is the hold-up? What is the delay? Have the finance yeah. minister decided to, to go ahead? What is the hold-up? Okay. So really what is, I don't think Pante was specific, but where, where there is a, a health risk, then people have got to ultimately take that as their number one priority, I would say. But look, specifically in terms of the hold-up, the hold-up is I could give you a decision today which would give some level of support to teachers, substitute teachers. It would not be of the same scale as if we can get if we can get external help. So that's where the trade-off is in relation to it. There are discussions which are taking place, different levels, which would involve some level of action from outside of this department. Now, uh, and I'm not necessarily purely saying referring something to, to DOF in relation to that. Here's the bottom line. I can give a decision today. A certain amount of money could be made available. But uh, if, if there is, by way of other options, are able to come forward and be brought to fruition, but it would require assistance from outside of this department, that would be a better package. For the, and that's where the, that's where the trade-off is. So, uh, you know, it may reach a point very soon where... Frankly, if it, isn't, it is clear that it's not going to be possible to have any level of assistance from outside uh, of the department, that we may simply need to uh, make a judgment call and make a certain amount of money available, but like, we don't have the same level of resources as potentially there. That's, that's really complicated. I appreciate this. What, what, specific, what specific assistance are you talking about, Peter, in terms of outside the, the department? The no, department? I, I, from that point of view, I'm, I'm not, because I don't want to prejudice any other discussions in relation to this on it, but... Okay. I'm just saying, M Minister, Minister, yep. internally, it's less than what we've done externally. Okay. Minister, just before you go, Morris, Catherine, do, would you ask anything different yep. that has already been asked here, so we can let the Minister away? Morris, Catherine? I think, um, there is just a short question for the Minister. Um, has the Department given any consideration to establishing a helpline for young people during this crisis? Um, so they can find out answers to questions they may have in relation to education. Um, many young people feel their voice has not been heard at such a critical time in their education. Well, there hasn't been a... I mean, that can be looked at, but, but there hasn't been specific. Where there has been where people have been under stress, the EA principles are... Schools are reaching. Schools are, are directly reaching out, but also in terms of the counselling service, we've uh, made sure that through that, in terms of support for those who are particularly vulnerable, that, that is remained in place an EA work uh, system and, and connected up, but there isn't a, uh, a specific um, helpline, I suppose, uh, maybe that really gets people who would actually be fully trained and, and now be able to answer all the, uh, the many and varied questions, but, you know, we're always happy to facilitate. This case, folks, I'm going to have to head up here, but uh, okay. wish, you, wish, you, wish you well to the rest. I'll leave you in, in the permanent secretary, Kim Bohan. Thanks. Thank, thank, thanks, Minister. Members, I'll, I'll, I'll take questions to the Permanent Secretary in reverse order of uh, questions asked to the Minister to try and make sure everyone has an opportunity to raise the issues that they would like to raise. Um, in that regard, is, is Morris Bradley there? Would you like to ask a question to the Permanent Secretary? Uh, still here, still here. Yeah. Uh, thank ahead, you very Morris. much, Chair. Yeah, I have a couple of questions if it's all right with you, sir. Uh, we've, we've talked quite a bit about the school deficits uh, and schools uh, may benefit from the rates holiday, uh, and if they do, by how much, and will that savings stay with the individual schools, or will be it subsumed into the bigger EA pot? Uh, and the other question uh, is, the, could, could you advise on the Fresh Start Capital Programme? The Department of Finance indicated that the Secretary of State had advised that £120 million of Fresh Start would be available for 2021 for shared and integrated education. Uh, the, the Department appeared to advise that only 20 20 million of this has been spent or will be spent. Will 100 million of fresh start money be lost to the executive? And could the, the, the uh, permanent secretary also tell me if the Westminster government has agreed to allow the executive to reprofile all the remaining 450 million pounds of fresh start money over the next few years? Derek? Okay. Um, probably those questions are better asked to your previous witnesses. Um, First, the, the, the second question first, fresh start capital. Um, 
We have been engaged uh, through the Department of Finance with the uh, UK government on permitting permission to reprofile the Fresh Start Capital because, as you're well aware, the Fresh Start Capital was profiled on a fairly rigid 50 million, 50 million, 50 million basis, with, which did not equate to the reality of spend and projects coming forward now. That um, question has not been bottomed out, but what I do know is that in the New Decade, New Approach document, there was a commitment, and that was a commitment uh, on the part of all parties, including the UK government, to look at reprofiling fresh start capital. I have to say, with the arrival of the COVID-19 crisis, a lot of those issues have been set aside. So that issue hasn't been run to ground. It isn't actually the schools, oh, sorry, for all controlled, maintained, and I think grant uh, maintained uh, integrated schools, it's actually the education authority which pays the rates bill, okay? So yeah. schools themselves would not benefit from any rates holiday. Um, it would be the education authority's budget which would benefit um, if we don't get a rates holiday, and I don't think we've asked for a rates holiday uh, because it has to be paid every year. This year is no different. Um, the, the, you know, that comes out of the EA's budget, but it doesn't come out of individual schools' budgets. Um, grammar schools can be a wee bit different. Uh, voluntary grammars, they do not pay rates on their educational premises, but they may have some other premises on site, maybe caretakers' houses or residential houses on which they would pay rates, but that comes out of their funding. Okay, Craig, thank you very much for those answers. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Catherine? Thank you, Chair, and thank you again, Derek. Um, I welcome the news this morning that the child care sector will have the opportunity to apply for support this week. Um, as we know, they've been largely in limbo since the announcement was made almost a month ago. Um, I have just a few wee questions around, around it. Um, how will they be able to apply? Will there be a helpline or a contact person if the sector have questions in, re in relation to the scheme? Um, will this also include details in an application process for settings that are currently closed and who may not be able to open again until um, we are over uh, the pandemic? Okay, the short answer is probably yes to all of those questions. I mean, as the, the Minister indicated, um, yeah, the funding was announced, I think, on the 9th of April. Um, this has been difficult to stand up. We are doing things that never done before and had to invent a process, an application process from scratch um, in a complicated area, particularly on the sustainability side for childcare settings, because there is potentially a cocktail of other funding there to provide support from other sources, such as the job retention fund and the small grant schemes operated by other departments. Um, so standing it up hasn't been easy. Normally, child care is funded, as you know, through the health and social care system. They are under massive pressure. But yeah. we agreed last week that the business services organization will administer this on behalf of both the Department of Health and the Department of Education. So we've been working through the application forms. We've been working through the guidelines for all the applicants. And as the minister says, we would hope that all of that will be made available to all of the parties uh, with all of the contact points made very, very clear and the application process made very, very clear um, within the next day or two before the weekend. Um, it's, all, I mean, it's all been agreed. It's just crossing the T's, dotting the I's, and hopefully applications can be bid for before the weekend. Okay. Thank you, Derek. Okay. And I think, yeah. actually... So somebody has just put under my nose a letter from the health minister to your committee clerk, which explains some of the issues. I think that letter, yeah, the letter is dated that may or may not have arrived with you, but I, I just think it, put I under think my it, nose. Yeah, I think it's, it's literally arriving, Derek, so we'll, we'll have a glance at that. Okay, Justin? What? Justin? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Derek. Derek, tell me, um, what are your thoughts on uh, chair of the review panel getting fifteen hundred pounds a day? Well, well, I mean that that is finger in the air time. Um, I have to say, you know, 
The new decade, new approach, made a commitment to a very detailed review of education. So when asked to scope what will such a review cost, bearing in mind that a key, phrase, a key word in the uh, commitment was independent, so it couldn't be somebody from within the system or within the department, it's somebody outside, unless you can identify someone of sufficient experience and stature to do it for free, we just made an estimate of what the cost might be. But it is only an estimate. It could be more than that. It could be less than that. Or someone altruistically could do it free of charge if we can find such a person. But it is only speculation at this stage. It isn't that we have struck a rate for the job and said that is definitely what somebody would be paid to do it. But we were just simply prudently trying to make some financial provision for all of the commitments made a new decade, new approach, as we did at the uh, start of the financial year. And I'm sure you probably were briefed on that in the last session. Okay. Um, good money, if you can get it, Derek, I think you can agree. Um, media speculation in Italy and Spain around schools reopening is creating a lot of uncertainty here. And has there been any movement towards guidance or advice to schools? Do you quell any speculation? And has a decision been made that it's definitely going to be September at earliest? No, I mean, I, I went out of my way last week at the committee to say there was no date, no target date, no planned date, no assumed date for schools reopening, and that absolutely remains the case. Now, I also said that we have started to do some work to consider the kinds of conditions that would have to be put in place for any kind of reopening of schools, and that is just prudent planning. We haven't got particularly far into that, but we have issued no guidance whatsoever on a date for reopening and whilst we can speculate on September I, I like everybody else have no idea what the position will be in September so as we stand today schools are generally closed that remains the position and we have no plans for their reopening in the short term and uh, you know I want to knock on the head any speculation about that uh, and that remains the minister's position too. Okay, thanks, Derek. How's, how's any guidance being issued to school leaders and teachers on home learning in relation to do's and don'ts? No, we have, we have... Sorry. Um, yeah, I think... Gosh, I might be repeating myself what I said earlier. I know we, we, we owe a more detailed paper to the committee on distance learning, hopefully which will set out in more detail um, both the short-term things and longer-term things and specifically individual work streams that we're putting in place around the different phases of education, preschool, primary, post-primary, Irish medium, and so forth. What we are doing is assigning to each individual school a designated link officer. And amongst other things, that officer's role is to support schools and school principals in identifying their needs for distance learning and supporting them in delivering distance learning. They are also helping us by providing the qualitative feedback to supplement the quantitative feedback we got in last Friday's survey and, and other mechanisms to move forward with this strategy and distance learning. Uh, and we'll be giving the committee more information on that. But I don't think we've issued a list of do's and don'ts to schools. Um, but schools are, are doing a tremendous job in this area. I know they are, and we're trying to put a bit more system and structure around it because, as the minister intimated, who knows, you know, as things move on into the future and there is a return to normal schooling, it still might be a mixture of distance learning plus in-school learning, and we need to be teed up for that. Okay, Justin. Yeah, and and I sorry, a couple of other questions. Couple of our questions uh, just one, one, last, one last question, point. Justin, and then I'm bringing Robbie in. Go ahead. Uh, on school report, you know, I know exams are always postponed, uh, Derek, but school reporting across all years has now been, it's now going to be a significant challenge for teachers and they will need some guidance in terms of how to move forward in that regard. I do want to also raise the issue of vulnerable children again and at risk children, and I know there's a note in the uh, pact in relation to uh, the, the existing safeguarding child protection arrangements for the teenage of day. Um, that's not enough. You know, the existing arrangements don't don't, will not suffice in these circumstances. And I want to know, given what was mentioned yesterday in relation to domestic abuse and four deaths, what data does the department hold or has the department liaised with any of such agencies to see what is happening in homes where children are at risk or potentially vulnerable in their own homes? 
Okay, sorry, I think I missed the first question. Did you ask, was the department going to issue guidance on school reports? Yes. Yeah, okay. I take that away. I think the answer is yes, because I have seen a question from a school on that issue. That might fall into the legislation space and the notice space, but I need to come back to the committee on that because it has been raised, and I'm a, I apologise, I don't have the answer to hand. I mean, on the second point, yes, as I've said before, this is an area of concern. Specifically on your question, what information, I think it's in the pack, uh, and the Minister mentioned it, we have uh, agreed with the Education Authority arrangements for them to provide more detailed reports on the interaction with their various services for vulnerable children, whether those are services provided directly to families or to schools in respect of vulnerable children, so that we can keep a check on the volumes of caseloads and the degree to which the statutory duties are being met at this time. In parallel with that, and this, that work will be a subset of the wider thing, I've mentioned before the ongoing work by the, led by the Department of Health to come up with a cross-sectoral, cross-government strategy on vulnerable children. We are actively inputting to that from an education perspective, but obviously justice and communities are also inputting to that along with health interests and specifically social services interests. So I fully recognise it's an issue of concern and work is being taken forward on a number of fronts to address it. Okay, Robbie. Okay, Butler. one, one last second. Rob sorry, Derek. Just in terms of... No, no, sorry, Justin. We'll have to move on. Robbie Butler. Yep, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, Derek, thank you very much for staying on the line. I just have one question. And if you were on the line um, previously, you, you will know what's coming, so you'll be well trapped and you'll give me a good answer. It's in relation to the, the budget and the uh, ask in and around the mental health and emotional wellbeing framework. So it was 10 million pre-COVID, it's 10 million during COVID. And all of the research would point towards an extended need for uh, mental health support um, uh, for young people. Um, there's, there's a lot of uh, professional uh, uh, information now available online, and, and you can see where young people are talking about the pressures that are being faced. Um, and with this likely to extend into the, the summer and beyond, that that pressure is extending to those young people who already have uh, mental health uh, ill health conditions is going to be built upon by those that are going to develop it through the, the pressures, the unintended pressures of, of the lockdown. Um, I was just disappointed to, to note that there wasn't any extended reach within the, the, the uh, allocation of funding or the, the ask for funding there. Um, and what we're, we are listening to repeatedly is um, COVID used for uh, rising out for either the money decrease in the budget or increasing, but I can't for the life of me understand why that hasn't been um, taken up because I can't think that there isn't going to be an extended need. So can you update us with regard to the mental health and emotional wellbeing framework and any talk there has been with regard to the impact of COVID and the current lockdown for our young people? Yeah, I'm sorry, I wasn't on the line for most of the previous discussion, so I didn't hear this issue raised, so I'm not prepped, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. So you've caught me cold there. Um, look, I mean, I fully agree with you. I don't think any of us quite understands what the final impact of this COVID crisis will be on mental health of anybody, of staff. And obviously, we have a particular concern around pupils, and I get that. Um, we had a bid in, um, and that remains our bid. I suppose the one thing I would say is the, all of the departments and all of the ministers, now the minister has left us, but the executive collectively, as you will well know, signed up earlier this week, or maybe it was at the back end of last week, to the proposal from the health minister, Minister Swan, to, to recruit and put in place a mental health champion who will take a view right across the board, across all sectors, across all departments, and it was a very deliberate policy um, to make sure that all departments contributed towards the costs of the mental health champion and the office that will be set up to support that champion. And we will be feeding into that. So, I mean, I suppose the short answer to your question is, yes, we recognize there are issues here and we will want to engage with the new mental health champion so that he or she can play into the problems we're going to face in the education sector. Um, our budget is what our budget is and it has been allocated 
you know, we can't um, expand that now. Whether it can be expanded in year through monetary rounds, so be it. There will be a long list of pressures, but I fully accept the demands in terms of mental health. And it's because of that that, you know, we have been at pains, or the Education Authority has been at pains, to keep the school counselling service for post-primary sector going. I know that's only part of it. We have a primary sector as well, um, and we highlighted the need for that. The work on the mental health framework will continue to the extent that we can. A lot of the people who have been working on that are now dealing with other things, but we're not letting that drop. That is a priority area, and we want to continue with that during the course of this year. Okay, Robbie, can I, can I move on then? Okay, to, um, to Daniel, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I was about to call you Minister there and nearly give you a promotion, Chair. No, no, is that a promotion or a demotion? <laughs> well, I, I, it, depends on, it depends on what the circumstances are. I'd say a demotion in this climate. Um, Peter, thanks very much again for uh, your uh, update and, and uh, the continued flow of information that is extremely helpful, particularly during these times and the same to the Minister as well. I know it's, it's, um, we're facing uh, considerable pressures and again just to pressure yourself uh, as the right-hand man to the Minister, uh, uh, Peter, about the uh, hardship fund for these sub-teachers. It is absolutely crucial, and I cannot stress this enough, that we do something for these uh, people. They're largely young people, largely young qualified teachers who we all know are a vital part of the teaching workforce, and a lot of schools could not survive without their necessary support and intervention when uh, other teachers are unavailable to continue in normal uh, teaching. So th th this is a, a very important thing, and we cannot at this critical time, when they need us, abandon them, because when we need them, they're there for us, and I think that's a very important thing that we need to be very clear about, and I know that yourself and the Minister will do all you can to ensure we try and get that £12 million of hardship fund to support them through this. So just on a, a, another point, um, uh, Peter, uh, a growing number of parents are also expressing great unease at the prospect of uh, teachers' assessment, part of the grading process for GCSE and A-level not being the subject of appeal. Uh, in order to maintain confidence in the appeal process, will uh, the Department undertake uh, to ensure that the appeal mechanisms put in place enables all aspects of how grades are determined to become the subject of robust professional independent scrutiny? Right. The... Um, the appeals process, as you know, is being developed by CCEA. They are working with their counterpart organisations in the other jurisdictions to ensure that there is a consistency across those mechanisms. And I think that is important too for third parties who will be looking at appeal mechanisms to make sure that they are equally robust. They will be consulted upon publicly, and I think that commitment has been given. So I think that's an important part of the process, and hopefully that will build confidence so that the appeals mechanism will be um, subject to proper scrutiny and to feedback before it is finalized. Um, on your first point about substitute teachers, look, I take your point entirely. Um, it is, you know, obviously we've lots of work going on in lots of areas, and a lot of it's very, very difficult, I have to say, in the circumstances, but this is the big sort of outstanding decision which um, is sitting there and it needs to be taken. I know it needs to be taken. The Minister has already covered that point. We need to get over that decision-making point and move on because you are absolutely right. Um, we depend on these people and they depend on us, so we need to move on and I accept the point. We'll push that as hard as we can. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's literally just to stress that you know, when you have a young teacher who is set out to invest in themselves by investing in education to better their lives and, and uh, also to help young people and educate them, uh, tell me on the other end of the phone they don't know how they're going to pay the bills at the end of this month. It's a very difficult thing to, to hear uh, and it's even more frustrating when I haven't got an answer uh, for them, but I, I do appreciate that it, um, it requires the, a level of funding and I do uh, hopefully appreciate that the department are taking this absolutely seriously. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'll just reinforce, I mean, the minister has already spoken for himself, but I can tell you that he is intensively engaged with his counterparts in the executive or the finance minister and indeed others in an attempt to get the, the optimal solution to this. Nothing's optimal at the moment, but the best possible solution. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Daniel. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Robin, Robin um, 
I leave Robin, Deputy Chair, and myself. I'll forego asking questions. Karen, did you have most of your questions answered by the Minister? Is Karen there? I did. Yeah, yeah. I did. Okay. Thank you. Robin, yeah. would you like to ask a final short question of the Permanent Secretary? Uh, um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll make a point, sure, rather than ask a question. It, it is the point down to questions I, I raised with the previous uh, uh, members from Gary and his team. Uh, I do really believe uh, the, the need for uh, investment, and I'll use the word investment in nurture, investment in the area of child care, and indeed that that needs to be linked in with the programme for government on the educational underachievement and socio-economic background. And if we are not going to get a joined up strategy, a joined up uh, uh, sufficient budget to adhere to addressing each of those three <coughs> areas, you know, we're nearly better not addressing any of them, to be honest, because we're only creating a, a false situation. So I do think, Derek, that whatever and um, whenever the, the department finally get the whole strategy together, those three areas need to be linked with sufficient budget. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I think that's an observation. I, I just generally, you know, new decade, new approach came along, new executive um, budget allocations. And suddenly everything has been thrown into disarray, and it is disarray by COVID-19 and all of those things that we were gearing ourselves up to address, hopefully in a strategic way, including, you know, the reviews that were prefaced in New Decade, New Approach, have unfortunately been set aside. And it is hugely disappointing. Um, it's hugely disappointing for me and for everybody else in the department, and I'm sure the committee that we've been distracted by this. But I'm afraid it's the situation we find ourselves in. But your points are well made, and those are all priority items on our agenda. Thank you, Chair. Chair, Chair can I just make a point? I really do need to go. I have uh, communities meeting at 1 o'clock. No yeah, we, we have to finish in the room by half 12 here as well, Robin, so uh, I, I understand. In, in closing with the Department, uh, particularly on the point of strategic actions, um, we understand the pressures um, presented by COVID-19. However, some of those strategic actions are, are, are key to enabling the Department of Education and the education system to respond to the ongoing challenge that will be exacerbated by COVID-19. So we need to return to some of those items, Permanent Secretary, but very, very grateful as always for your time with us this week. Um, we were further challenged with the addition of the budget briefing and that has truncated time even further this week. We'll, we'll take that into consideration for future weeks, but we're, we're grateful for the, the updates with which you've provided us today. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks. Okay, members, I can ask the, the clerk to summarise actions uh, following from both briefings and in particular with regards to the decisions we need to take for the budget debate on Tuesday. Clark? So, Chairperson, if members can hear me, if you turn to your tabled items and look at page 21, um, I had a go at uh, where I thought the committee might be uh, in terms of the, the budget brief. Now, there are some things that are going to have to change uh, because the department has clarified um, that it, it intends to uh, you know, live within its budget. It's not seeking an additional $165 million, um, though you know, I'm sure it would take it if it get it. Uh, but that the um, so consequently, I'll change that bit of text. Also, members, just to be clear, it's something that members have talked about before, um, that if you look at the pay pressure, so the annual pay pressure goes up from about 100 million uh, in 2021 to 206 million in 2022-23, um, and there are some assumptions underneath that. But um, the consequences of that uh, members have discussed before, may be that uh, uh, a wide-ranging reform of education may be required. Now, is it too much for me to say that, or are members content for me to indicate that in the response that the committee would make to the Committee for Finance on the Budget? Chairperson. Okay, so members, the, the clerk will go through a, a set of questions here. If members are, are reasonably content, if we, if we say agree, if members have any fundamental objections, then make those known. But 
to, to recap that first question, it, it's effectively our, our our members adequately concerned about pay pressures um, in future years for for that to be raised in our in my contribution to the budget debate, and also to make a reference to what I I referenced in closing there that there, there is while strategic actions are difficult in this context, they are ultimately going to be necessary to deal with these pressures. Are members content with that? Okay, thanks, Clark. Okay, uh, Chairperson, members, are there any yep. elements? Yep. Sorry. Uh, someone want to come in there? No, no, just saying content. Okay, okay thanks, Morris. Thanks, Morris. Uh, so, are there any elements of the pressures that um, you have concerns about? For example, uh, members had mentioned previously about prep schools and boarding schools. Is that something you want to raise? Um, or would we just go with it? Uh, yeah, Chair, can I just say that Peter is breaking up on me? Okay. Do you want to? Can you come any closer? Or um, speak slightly um, louder. Sorry. Can, can, can you hear me now, um, Robin? I can just, hear you now, Peter. Okay. okay. Just, yeah. Sorry about that. It's uh, just: are there any elements of the the pressures which uh, the department has uh, identified, which members have any difficulties with? I think previously members were happy with it all. Um, you know, they, they would want more money for education for all of the things that were mentioned. Are there any that that give you pause? Uh, and members had mentioned in the last meeting something around the additional money for COVID-19 for uh, prep schools and boarding schools. Is that the case, or um, are you content with uh, all of the pressures? Uh, just, uh, in, re in relation to prep schools, uh, Chair, uh, it's noted that schools have lost funds because pupils aren't, aren't attending. Um, I just want more information around that as to how that works, or whatever, because Obviously, for it's, this other part is for a different department, uh, but there's quite a lot of students that aren't able to attend university, but they're still liable and responsible for the fees. Uh, yeah. There needs to be... Yeah, I, I think if members are content, we'll seek further clarity on that particular pressure. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thanks. Already done that. Okay, um, so that then, um, is it the case uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the minister's indicated that the pay deal is obviously going to be uh, paid, uh, the consequences then of a £165 million shortfall might be quite significant for, at a guess, school budgets and SEN provision. So is that the committee's position that they are um, concerned um, that the £165 million um, will be uh, you know, a real challenge uh, for the department and in particular those two areas? So me members, members content for, for me and my contributions to reference concern for what that £165 million point pressure could mean for school budgets and same provision? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, just following on from comments I made earlier, it's definitely a concern from what I've uh, noted in the, in the papers that were sent out. Uh, we do need cl further clarification in relation to it and even going beyond that in terms of the uh, the pay pressures as well for teachers and non-teachers, which oh, be addressed. moving from yeah. 80 million to 206 million. Like, how is that going to be paid and, you know, on an annual basis, particularly with the pressures that already exist? And has that been factored in? We just, I didn't get to that earlier yeah. with um, uh, Gary Fair, but we do need some clarification around mm -hmm. that. Okay. Uh, thanks, Here. members. Here. Yeah, can, Sir, can I just come on in, in relation to that? It's, it's coming out of this situation as well. It's, uh, there needs to be extra support and resources put on for those who are already underachieving. Um, and that that is going to have to, if we get back on the schools in September, there's going to be, have to be an extra layer put on and very, very, very focused um, and targeted towards those young people. So I think that is very important going forward. Okay. Thanks. Agreed. Agreed. Person. Members agreed? Yeah, and there's no money set aside for that either. That's the only thing worth noting. No, um, that's what's going to have to be looked at. If they're, if they're going to realistically say maybe that they're not going to be able to spend some of those budget headings by the, the end of um, the financial year, it's going to have to be maybe redirected over or budged for. Yeah, I see, I see at Westminster a question has been submitted with regards to a, a catch-up premium for schools to assist yeah. with the additional support. Members content for me to make reference to that in contributions, agreed? Agreed. Agreed, agreed. okay. Agreed. Finally then, just in terms of the capital budget, um, so what the department indicated there was they, they've got their budgets, um, but they intend to revisit that throughout the year. So the, obviously they would be program driven, but there may be quite big changes. If construction is down for 
months. Uh, I don't know how long it will be or won't be. Um, but is it the case the committee are content to view that as unwelcome, but nonetheless inevitable, and that they accept it? Is that the case, Chairperson? Yeah. Th so just to recap, Clark, members content to express concern with regards to how the capital budget is expended in the current climate um, and to seek, seek further assurances to that regard. Clark, is that, yes. is that what we're saying? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Members agreed? Just, just, just on that, Chair, and I'm yeah. sorry for being a stickler here, but obviously no, please, COVID-19 please has, yeah, has, really, has really got to me and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at everything at, the, at this stage. Uh, I've just got, got, got some concern around, obviously, the reduction of uh, uh, the allocated funds from 84 million to 64 million when we know of the poor condition of the schools estate and it needs significant investment as we've said in previous committee meetings prior to COVID-19 so we just need to seek some clarity around that figure being reduced by 20 million. Um, and we agreed that we may submit written questions to uh, Philip um, so if we could Clark seek a uh, written explanation for that well, the reduction. Chairperson, just if members look to their meeting packs, yep. actually at page 40 of your meeting pack, it actually breaks down um, the capital budget into to know, you know, all of that, to so the, um, the major works, uh, the SEP stuff, and the, 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 the minor works. So it is all, um, it is all set out there. Um, and as I said, the department is um, project driven, so they will. Um, so projects will fall by the wayside. Projects will um, will be completed, and what they're saying is they're just going to revisit it through the year. So um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what question we're going to ask or what answer we're going to get. What they're going to say is, um, well, look, there's our project. Those are the things that we want to do, uh, but that's probably will not be right. They'll end up doing something different because of the, the position that uh, construction uh, in the wider economy is as a consequence of uh, COVID-19 restrictions. So the, the sense? question that I'm not 100% sure we got answered is why was it? Why is the budget being reduced from 84 to 64? Because I think that's what they got. They asked okay. for 200 million um, okay. or around that, or maybe it was 184 million, and they, they got less than they asked for. Okay, okay. So. Well, Hopefully, does that answer then, um, Daniel? Yeah, I still think it's important to put on record our concern in relation to it, Chair, and just seek further clarification on it, particularly given the, the state of the, of the yeah. oh, Fair enough. Okay. okay, members agreed, yep. Yeah. Okay, that'll, agreed. Agreed. that'll do agreed. me then. I'm presuming then members are content also for the Chair to again uh, repeat the uh, committee's support for Book Trust. Uh, which is a small, small beer, very important project, but no, uh, in the scale of things is small. Yeah. Members are content. Members content. I didn't catch it. Member, well. Members content for me to reference ongoing support for funding allocation to support Book Trust? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Are, there, are there any other budget lines that you think need referenced in the contribution on Tuesday? Obviously, members can make their own contributions, but this is from a, a committee perspective. Content? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So can I seek the committee's agreement for me to reflect those views at the budget debate on the 5th of May? Agreed? Agreed. And can I seek the committee's Great. agreement for the clerk to write to the committee for finance, setting out our views on the budget uh, as indicated at page 21 of table papers and further to the matters raised uh, today. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item 7, and we are finishing at half 12 members. Um, agenda item 7 is correspondence. Can I ask the clerk to speak to it? Chairperson, this is a simple one. It's uh, members are asked to note the uh, five items of uh, correspondence. Um, they're all um, they're all important matters, but uh, I think there's no action actually required in respect of all of them. If members are content, chairperson, members content. Yeah. Chair, I am. Okay. I am going to sign off at this point. No problem, Robin. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. okay, members. Any other comments on correspondence or content note? Okay. Okay. Can I ask the clerk to speak to departmental COVID nineteen correspondence? Shall we park that chairperson and okay. go to forward work program as we're losing members? Okay. Agenda item eight forward work program. Can I refer members to the draft forward work program on page three one three of your packs? 
and remind members that owing to the COVID-19 restrictions, formal committee meetings are limited to around two hours and can only be held on Wednesdays. And remind members that we previously agreed to use the Wednesday formal meetings by and large for updates from the department and other statutory bodies uh, and to generally try to arrange informal meetings for other uh, times. Can I ask members, um, would they like to uh, going forward, um, given recently revised guidance from the chairperson's liaison group, to, to stick to that approach? Clark, do you want to say anything in relation to that? Yeah, so chairperson, um, that's one of the reasons we're in a wee bit of a rush today is that we only really get two hours uh, in this room. Our communities will be in uh, very shortly behind us. So consequently, um, the thinking would be to keep the, uh, these formal meetings for our update uh, from the minister, uh, well, usually from the minister, but always from the prime minister secretary, and then to use informal meetings maybe on a Monday afternoon for pretty much everything else. Um, and some, most of those things, would, um, almost everything we'd be doing would be COVID-19 related. But some of the things that members have asked to talk about aren't, for example, saying statement thing. So you can see the forward work programme uh, at page um, 313. The idea, if you're happy, would be that we would hear from the childcare uh, providers uh, this Monday at two o'clock. And then the following Monday, uh, it could be AQE and PPTC to talk about um, COVID-19 and uh, uh, post-primary transfer. Uh, on the 18th of May, then, in the informal session, uh, we'll be talking to the Northern Ireland Teachers' Council, if they agree. Monday 25th is, of course, the bank holiday, which I forgot. And then, say, looking over the page, you can see 1st of June, it would be Nikki on its SEN review, which is not related to COVID-19 at all. Uh, 8th of June... Uh, EA and its SEN report, 15th of June, NCB on the emotional health and well-being framework. So if members are happy to do it that way, we can make arrangements. So it just, it does mean two meetings. The Monday meeting will be informal. It'll be a teleconference. We won't broadcast it. The Wednesday meeting will be what we're doing now, but that will be in reserve really for the department uh, and their update. And we would try and squeeze in the uh, Department of uh, Health on the uh, the uh, child care package at some point whenever they're ready to talk to us about it. So uh, if members are content with that approach, Chairperson. Yeah, so if I, if I can recap members. So as we say, our Wednesday formal meeting is, is significantly restricted compared to normal. It's approximately 10 a.m. to 12 at noon. Okay, and that will by and large be with the department, the minister, or other statutory bodies on urgent COVID-related issues. We're, I'm conscious that there are other ongoing issues, as the clerk has referred to, you know, relating to particular organisations. Though is Monday afternoon at 2 p.m. Uh, a suitable time to set aside to try and facilitate informal meetings with as with with a proposed schedule as set out by the clerk. Chair, uh, just, uh, Daniel, sorry, yeah. uh, I'm just, I can understand uh, that we're on, on, under P, particularly uh, today, but is it possible even on a temporary basis to review, like do we have to do this on a Wednesday, could we find a Thursday slot or, or so to fit this all in on the one go as opposed to trying to split this? I, my understand, I'll bring the clerk in, Daniel, but my understanding is that committees are being provided with a specific slot given the... The, the social distancing arrangements in the assembly, but I'll let the clerk speak to that in a bit more detail. No, it, it's just what the chairperson said, but also the ad hoc committee uh, tends to meet on a Thursday, and what we're, I think, endeavouring to do is to avoid a clash. So it's uh, that, that's why the Wednesday, I've been doing a lot of bargaining to try, us get it, try and get us a bit longer, as we did today. Um, so if you're willing to start at half nine, um, then um, we, we get two and a half hours, but uh, there's just there's no way. I mean, I mean, members were doing well, but struggling to make the important points and you know get their questions answered. So just just to be clear, Clark, are we, is it is it actually possible for us to hold a committee meeting other than at half nine to twelve on a Wednesday morning? I would say that it is not because there are other um, committees that are trying to meet as well. Okay. And I, that, Daniel, we could, the clerk and I can explore that, but my understanding is we're designated half nine to 12, 12.30 on a Wednesday um, for our formal meeting. Sure, not, not to be greedy on it, but you know, 
like I, I would leave I would leave Straban usually around seven or half six in the morning when the assembly is actually functioning in normal times. So I have no issue with the committee meeting at nine o'clock if that's a viable option. Yeah, it's viable for me if it's viable for members. Okay, well look, we can, we'll, we'll, I'll ask the clerk to review those timings with the members outside the formal meeting today, but yes, um, I'm open as well to stretching that slot that we're provided on a Wednesday as far as we can. Um, the point remains though that um, it is challenging to facilitate anything beyond departmental and, and statutory body meetings during that time. and. And given that there are ongoing issues that we do have uh, concern for, childcare, postpartum transfer, engagement with the teacher unions, uh, Children's Commissioner report on SEN, EA audit of SEN, uh, National Children's Bureau on Emotional Health and Wellbeing Framework, my thinking was that rather than delay those two beyond um, the current circumstances, that we could to use the format that we have been using successfully previously as well of that informal meeting slot. Previously it was Tuesday. It seems that Tuesday is the assembly business slot now going forward. Therefore, I think that that Monday afternoon was identified as a possible uh, standing time where we could attempt those informal meetings. Are, are members loose, you know, content with that approach and that we try to program a schedule to that regard or any other comments or feedback? No, I'm happy enough, Chair. I'd be happy enough with that too, Chair. Obviously, that, that, that there'll be teleconferencing as well, so we can we can hold those meetings from, from any location that you have access to teleconferencing or, or, or video conferencing facilities. Members content? Hmm? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Can. can I also seek members' agreement then that we would take a formal oral briefing from the Department of Education and the Department of Health on childcare arrangements on the 20th of May 2020, if that's suitable for DE and DEH, and from yep. Department of Education on preschool admissions on the 27th of May. Agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Okay, that's great. Clark, any other business in that regard? No? Okay, members, agenda item nine then is any other business? Yeah, just a small point, Chair, and I, I should have raised it at the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, it was disappointing on the way to the office this morning to do this call to hear the leak on BBC News. Um, it's, it's just not appropriate, and uh, I'm not particularly pointing the finger at anyone in particular, but it's just unhelpful, I think, generally, until we get a, a wider discussion on these matters. Okay, important, important to note that. Okay, thanks for that, Daniel. Um, any other business? Okay, members, then uh, our next meeting will be Monday the 4th of May by teleconference at 2 p.m., and that will be with the child care providers, Clark. Yep. Uh, it's scheduled to be 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. The next formal committee meeting will be Wednesday the 6th of May in room 29, uh, scheduled to start at 9.30 a.m. unless otherwise agreed. Uh, can I put the question that the committee does now adjourn? Agreed? Great. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Thanks, members. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.